Whale writing in the UK is uh, is unregulated, so it's like the Wild West at times. You can completely, start, yeah, yeah. You can start a whale writing business tomorrow, uh, having been in prison for the last five years. Because a whale is is really a it's a, a legal instrument that just directs what should happen after you pass. And for us, with anyone that has children, it's all about the children because it's not about the value of the estates. I think that's where people get mixed up. You touched yeah. on it just now. It, it's not what you've got, really. It's about who would you want to raise your children if the worst happened? So, you know? Let's say £100,000 in a savings account, and you decide to give that away to, to a third party, you know, nephews, nieces, cousins, whatever. Uh, you've got to survive seven years before that becomes outside of your estate and it's tax-free. Seven. She's knocked on the door. This woman opened it, and she looked at me. And before her sister could say anything, she went, you are ridiculous. That's the first thing she said to me. <laughs> and I went, oh, you saw me, didn't you? <laughs> and she went, she said, I've just been telling my husband that some clown has got out of a car window, <laughs> built like a brick outhouse, and he's fallen on the floor. Me and Harry were actually fucking crying yesterday. I'd done this like nice little Darce move on yeah. him, right? And I like shot through for a Darce, which is like a choke on the yeah. neck. Shot through and he's that wide and big, like his head and his shoulders. <laughs> I couldn't get the Darce out, like nowhere near. Oh and I just sat there laughing and he was pissing himself because yeah, we yeah. just, he was like, that was really good what you done. And I was just fucking, I was like a year later again. You got a little T-Rex armed as well. Oh no, that's what I, so I did say that. Jordan that. Pickford. That's, no, that's what I said. I said my little fat arms, mate, couldn't get there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but his neck and your arms are yeah, just going to no, choke no, any no, day no, the Yeah, it's never going to happen. Uh, no. Good. Right, I'm going to attempt to do an introduction. Okay. I He's say this every time, it's becoming a little bit of a cliche now, yeah, but I'm no, pretty okay. bad at them. But oh, so, that's all right. Someone's got to do it, and oh, Danny's yeah. not going to. I completely refuse, so. Do you? Yeah, no, I'm not doing that. I'll just rather carry yeah. on, but they are good. He, he says they're bad, but they're getting better, definitely. They are oh, getting better, that's so we'll, we'll see. Yeah. And that's why I've only like put a few bullet points on, because any yeah, more, yeah. I'll definitely cock it up, so yeah, I'll give it a go. Um, and then we'll just dive straight in, mate, if that's all right. Yeah, Happy? yeah, fine, yeah, we'll just chat. Okay. All right. Welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Today, we're talking legal services and the importance of having a will with Trevor Worth. Trev is the managing director and founder of Portcullis Legals. He has 35 years experience in legal services industry and is a global four-day-a-week pioneer. Apparently so, yeah. Apparently so. <laughs> How are you, mate? Very, very good. Just to clarify, this isn't a Friday because if it was, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. Is that right? Well, yeah. you guys wouldn't. No, we probably wouldn't. <laughs> you wouldn't. Well, <laughs> You're taking you your know, weekend, right? Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. I, I do find with it though, you uh, you do end up working Friday sometimes because uh, it's it's that clear space day. Yeah. So when no one's in and you can just get on with some of the, the work you need to do and focus. So. Uh, Maybe that's a little bit disingenuous, you know, that I, the team does the four day work. Mate, you give your staff four days, I think. Yeah. They always have four days, yeah, and they love it. I'm and sure that, they won't mind if you work five, mate, as long as No, no, it's no problem, you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, five days work for four days pay for me, but they get four days work for four days pay. Yeah. So, so they, do they work extra hours for that? Uh, no, they, they do uh, 8.30 to 5.30, Monday to Thursday, and some do Tuesday to Friday. Mm-hmm. So you can have a, a long weekend, you know, either side. And if you oh, really... so they choose whether to do a, a Monday to fr- Monday to Thursday or a Tuesday to Friday? Yeah, we, but we diarise that in advance because you've got to plan, you know. Yeah. you know, We're not a big team, but you've still got to make sure every, every base is covered so that clients can still get hold of you on, on a Friday, you know, particularly. But most firms have, have brought it in and, and feel... It's been good for them because it's certainly good for morale. Mm. It's good for retention of staff mm. as well. You don't tend to lose too many people. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's attractive to recruit people as well. And uh, and productivity goes up because people are more efficient. You know, they they realise that it, it, it's, it's not a contractual thing either. It's a gift. So every year we sit down and say, did it work last year? Should we retain it this year yeah, going okay. forward? Yeah, that's just clever. So yeah. if, yeah, if, so so it, you keep it. Yeah, if it didn't work, would you, would you revert or would you never revert now, do you think? I've got to be careful what I say, because I? I, I could stitch myself up, you know. No, but being serious, if it, if, it, if it didn't work and you felt you weren't as productive, would you go back to a five-day? Or do you think now you've been productive, you can't see a reason why it wouldn't be? It's a difficult one. I think, you know, the onset of hybrid working and all that sort of thing and uh, the pandemic. And we, we did it before the pandemic was ever a thing. Yeah. Uh, but I think we'd embrace hybrid working more now. You know, I think people do want to work from home on certain days. Uh, I, I don't think it's healthy that they're at home all the time, personally speaking. I think they miss out on collaboration with colleagues and, and just, you know, it sounds a, a laddish thing to say, but the, the banter between them as colleagues, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so... 
I, I, I probably won't ever go back to it. If I say probably, that covers both bases, you know, which <laughs> yeah. is quite good. Uh, yeah. Just in it, case, yeah. Yeah, but it's been good for us as a business, you know, and it's, it's good, uh, it's certainly good for the for the team, you know, and, and they would miss it terribly Yeah, because their their life you know, mm. revolves around it now, but it's great. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. We were, saying, uh, we were saying offline just before we started that, for me, this is a really exciting podcast. And I never thought I'd say that about anything legal because the two <laughs> don't go hand in hand. But I think up to now, most of the episodes that we've done, certainly on some level of, of been a, a topic that I'm familiar with at mm. least and, and some, you know, I could be a, a bit of an expert in. Yeah. But this is the first topic, I think, that I'm genuinely really clueless about all of the stuff that it is you do. And I was looking at your website earlier and you've got the, uh, to, to quote a line you've got on there, see how we can help protect your family for the future. And you've put in bold, we can protect your family. Mm. And that really drew me in a little bit because I guess I hadn't really thought about legal or legal companies sort of in that way. So I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about some of the services that you offer mm. and, and what that, that particular strap line actually means. Yeah, sure. I think uh, for most people, law, like you said, is quite dry. It's it's quite a grey world, isn't it? It's, we always talk about, you know, people's expectations are of pinstripe lawyers. Yeah. Maybe some of them, rightly or wrongly, jargon, talking down to you, making people feel uncomfortable very expensive because you don't know where you go and it's a bit like when you go into a garage sometimes and you say oh, i need my car fixed and then they go Phew. you know you, you <laughs> don't know they yeah. fucking looked at it <laughs> Lawy <laughs> lawyers are the same but they just don't make that noise generally you know and uh, but there's some fantastic law firms out there you know in all different sort of uh, sectors but I think they, they've missed the point sometimes that you know, it's all about the customer, isn't it, the client, because they're the ones with the problem. They're the ones with the, you know, the distress in many cases, because I think a lot of legal matters are distress purchases, aren't they? They're, they're very much, I need to do something about it because something's happened by and large, whereas we try and be the other way around and say, do it in advance, you know, put, put estate planning in advance. So, so in the States, typically, they, they love doing this. They buy lots more life insurance, for example. Uh, they're proud of their pension pots that they build up. And they talk about all their estate plannings in place, so wills, trusts, powers of attorney, because I think... It, in our world, in, in the UK, it's 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 quite a negative connotation because it's it's all about death and it's about injury and illness. When what we're saying is it's a thoughtful thing to to put something in place for your family, protect them, look after them. You know, while you're here, while you're fitting well, do something about it because you've got control then, haven't you? Mm. Whereas uh, if you leave it until something happens, and I don't mean ultimate death, although obviously that does happen sadly. Uh, it's it's if you fall ill, you know, if you're a business owner and you've got business interests, who's going to run that if you're not well enough to do so, you know? And a business power of attorney can sort that out, you know? Is, you, that, is that what you do? Like, you can sort all that type of stuff out? Yeah. Well? So we, we look at, you know, people's personal affairs, you know, what's their family structure like? And as you know, you know, one myself, we, we live in blended families now, don't we? There's lots of families, people who have been married before, children from different relationships, Lots of people are married now, living together, but they've they've got all these sort of variances going on in their in their life, and they just need to sit with someone who's you know good at what they do, you know, fully qualified, very experienced. Uh, and I know we've all got to get experience somewhere. You've got to start somewhere, but but look at someone who, who's been around the block a little bit and 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 understands all the nuances of of you know family dynamics and and situations really, and then just give them the appropriate advice. Mm -hmm. And even if it's just putting a, a goodwill in place, you know, at least that's a start. But you find people look for uh, the cheapest thing they can find online. You know, we always talk about don't ask me uh, any advice because you've got your Google lawyer, haven't you? You've got your Google doctor. You know, when we're all not yeah. well, what do, what do people do? But, you know, or Fred from the pub. Fred is given the best <laughs> advice because he knows someone who knows someone. You know, go to a professional on it. If, if I want my, um, I don't know, my, my boiler fixed at home, I wouldn't try and do it myself, would I? I'd get in somebody who's really good at what they do, their, you know, their uh, gas safe register and all that sort of thing. It's the same with legal advice. You know, go and see somebody who's suitably qualified and uh, and and just listen tell them what you you want to uh, explain is your issue you know your worries they'll tell you things that also you know you don't know what you don't know because uh, we don't no. <laughs> in, in any yeah, walk exactly, of life yeah. and explain you'll have the situation explained to you and then you can come up with the best solution and if it's done in a friendly affordable way because that's the other thing especially in this you know era we're in now where it's uh 
you know, the, the cost of living crisis, which I think the, the media is driving all the time as well, you know, uh, people are very cost conscious. So you need to be able to give fixed fees, speak in plain English and be nice people about it because it's not an attractive subject. It's not the sexiest thing in the world, is it, to talk about wills and trusts and powers of attorney. But uh, people spend more time booking their holidays. They spend more time on Facebook. Uh, they spend more time... Uh, discussing things that really are not that gonna are not gonna have that much of an impact on them, but you know, an hour with somebody who knows what they're doing, they can sort most things out for you, you know. And it's peace of mind you buy, and it's a kindness thing about it, you know. It's like uh, you love your family. We should do. You love your family, you know. You you may love certain charities you're linked to. Uh, you know, you you owe a duty of care to your family as well as your colleagues at work. So why wouldn't you put things in place that just protects them, you know? Yeah. But again, it's you know, it, it, it's trying to make it attractive enough for people to do it without them thinking uh, in, in our British way that it's all about death and misery because yeah. it's not. It's thoughtful. When people when when people think about wills and about all that type of stuff, you think of the financial stuff. Uh, like, if they haven't got a lot of money, a lot of the time they think, is it worth doing? But again, even if they've got a little something, it's always worth doing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You always think of like higher, you know, the higher, big earners, big people like that worrying about their estates and about stuff like that. But I think the yeah. difference is, is maybe like right across the mm. board, mm. like a regular bloke who's got maybe £40,000 into his mortgage, it's still worth doing, isn't it? Because you still got to protect that. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think this is, this is quite, a, I think, a good opportunity for us here because you mentioned about Ask Google. Mm. Um, YouTube's now the second biggest search engine on the planet. Yeah. So people search stuff on YouTube nearly as much as they do Google now. Um, and to Danny's point, I guess, you know, we're kind of pitching this to ourselves to some extent, which is just everyday yeah. blokes. And I'm already chomping at the bit to ask you questions about mm. some of your services on whether they apply to me. Yeah. So I wonder if we can maybe go through that. So I think I've pulled out six services from your website. Okay. Um, and it'd be amazing, I guess, to understand, um, you know, what they are, mm. um, why they're important, who they would apply to. Yeah, sure. And, and just on, on Danny's comment there, I'll start with, with the will. Mm. You know, I'm... 40. Um, <laughs> I have a child, but I'm not married. Um, would someone like me need a will? So what, what is a will for those that might be completely ignorant to what it is? Um, why is it important? Who would it apply to? A will is, is really a, it's a, a legal instrument that just directs what should happen after you pass. And for us, with anyone that has children, it's all about the children because it's not about the value of the estates. I think that's where people get mixed up. You touched yeah. on it just now. It, it's not what you've got, really. It's about who would you want to raise your children if the worst happened, you know? Because if there's no will in place, and it's the only legal document where you can name a guardian, then uh, social services obviously get involved because they've got to look after the best interests of the vulnerable, the children. Uh, children have just lost a parent or parents, uh, obviously extremely distressing time, and there's no direction from anyone. So the parent who loved them to bits during the, their lifetime... Uh, is not here to make any decisions. You you hear quite often where, especially August, J June, July, August, we hear it a lot where people say, I'm going on holiday, I've told my sister, if anything happens to me, because <laughs> obviously the plane's going <laughs> to crash, uh, if anything happens to me, then she's to look after, you know, my, my son and daughter. Well, it's a bit strange because the son and daughter is on the plane with you, you know, so that's that's a weird thing to begin <laughs> yeah. with. But but it's uh, it's that thought process of I can just say whoever it is or I can leave a little note or... And we've seen them. We've seen notes, paper notes, where people have written, if, if I were to die on holiday, I appoint, you know, my brother. Well, brother may not be the most suitable one in the world, you know. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons to appoint guardians, you know, whether that's on uh, geographic considerations, education, uh, religious beliefs, you know, all sorts of things you need to consider. And sometimes your family are not the best people, are they? It may be a close friend circle you've got. But if you've not given direction to who should do this in a legal way, then the courts will decide. And it's as simple as that. I've genuinely never thought of it like that. Straight away, yeah. when you've said will, I always think money. Yeah. Money and assets. Yeah. I've never once, and that's made me think now, I need a will for my son. Straight yeah. away. <laughs> you said that, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. you know, because it's exactly that. It it's is, like, yeah. you know, there's certain people in my family I hope, who are really close that I wouldn't want my son being brought up by. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. by that, I would definitely want not that not to be decided by the courts. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Because yeah. that would be maybe an immediate, but... Yeah, you know what I'm trying course. to say? So 
Yeah. hundred percent. I didn't know that. Did no. you ever think of that? No. No. no never I once thought that with yeah. Archer. Never. So it's, it's framing it in a way that, you know, touches people, I think, rather than just, just money. It, it's about, yeah, those that are nearest and dearest to you, that are minors, you know, they need to be made sure they're, they're looked after. And again, you know, with, with people who are not married, that's that's even worse situation, really, because... Uh, even with estates, you know, if you if if you've got a partner and you're unmarried, then it doesn't automatically fall to the the surviving partner because you're not married. So why why should you inherit something if you've not tied the knot, as it were, whether that's civil partnership or, or traditional marriage? Uh, so people who are not married need wills more than people who, who aren't. Mm-hmm. Uh, although we would encourage everyone, as soon as you're 18, and I know it's the last thing you want to think about 18, you think about when we were all 18, you know, long time for me now, but you look back and think the will is the last thing. But we've got clients who are 18, 19, 20, 21. People think we've only got 80-year-olds or 90-year-olds, but it's it's for everyone, really. It's just it's, it's that thoughtful document to say, if this happens to me, this is where I want it to go. And it's as simple as that. And we make it simple because we talk in plain English and and in an honest way, you know, and, and have proper discussions with them. The other thing with uh, with guardianship as well is that it's the financial implications because it's quite all right to say, well, my three children should go to my sister. Your sister may not be as financially well off as you. So how is she going to raise three three children? And we'll raise that question with people and maybe they should take out a life policy or put that in trust or, you know, we, we're not financial advisors. But so you look at like a whole package for people, if that yeah. makes sense. So then it seems part of, but yeah, if they did pass away, oh yeah, it goes to your sister and they get this amount in a life policy and they could look yeah. after the children. Yeah. Whereas if they didn't do that, it's exactly right. Again, it's probably Absolutely. something you would never think about. No. And most of our business comes from uh, financial advisors, accountants, other solicitor practices, uh, any anybody in a professional sort of setting that that looks after one aspect of someone's life. We then get referred in, can you do the estate planning? So we'll tidy all that up. But if it's things like life policies, which are really important, uh, we would refer that back to, you know, one of the IFAs we work with and and, and they would deal with that. So at least you know that the client's getting best advice all the way around. What's an IFA? It's an independent financial advisor. Uh, So they, they, you know, choose from whole of market sort of policies and investments and pensions, that sort of thing. So it's important they get good advice because, you know, we're – we're, we're top level qualified in the Southwest. There's, there's no firm more qualified than us in our niche area. Uh, and that's the sort of advisors we use, you know, for, for our clients to give financial advice because you want to work with somebody similar, don't you? you yeah, know, of course, The same yeah. values and purpose and all that sort of thing as well. But no, it is important. It's really, really important. And it's a dull subject. That's the problem. So Yeah, it's a morbid one as well, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Like yeah. you say, especially, is. especially when you're younger, I think you're just not in touch with your mortality at all. So it's just no. the last thing you think about. But yeah, I certainly hadn't thought about that. So no. uh, you might have a new customer, mate. Well done. Oh, that'd be good. That'd be <laughs> good. Five, five minutes. Two, yeah, two five minutes. Yeah. Two we'll look out out <laughs> awesome. Uh, the next thing, and um, I, I don't know what this is, um, probate and estate administration. Yeah, that's the basis, really. Uh, probate just means the proving of a will. So when someone's passed away, it has to go through certain uh, checks and processes, really, to make sure that the probate courts can issue a, a grant of probate to say that, this was the person's will. It was signed correctly and witnessed correctly. It was their intent. They did it of their own free will and of sound mind. And and the executors in the will, they're the people who carry out the wishes of the will. They uh, they see that through and then collect in all the assets of the estate. They pay any debts on the estate and then they distribute any gifts within that estate. Uh, and then whatever's left called the residue and that will go to the residuary beneficiaries. So that could be typically if it was husband and wife to each other, then on to the children and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and and it, it's important that it's done correctly because you, you do get people who feel they can do this themselves and some can. If it's a simple estate, great. But what if there's other things in there like uh, overseas properties, business interests, mm-hmm. life interests, you know, all of a sudden it's starting to get a little bit complicated. And again, as I alluded to earlier, it's probably better to go and just seek professional advice and, and get that. I would say that, wouldn't I, obviously. <laughs> but sometimes we get clients who come in and they say, you know, sadly, you know, my father's passed away. Can you help with this? And we'll just look at it and say, look, this is quite straightforward. You can go and do that yourself. And that saves them a lot of money. So we'll always be honest, always be transparent. Mm-hmm. 
but that wins us clients because they then come back and do their own estate planning because so, yeah. they know they can trust us, you know, and that's really important. So it's just the, the process of, of closing someone's estate, really, yeah. and then making sure the appropriate beneficiaries get what they uh, were entitled to. Yeah, 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 yeah got it. Okay. Um, and you've just mentioned there sort of simple and not simple estates, and you kind of already touched on, I guess, what a less simple estate would be. What, what's the definition of that? A simple estate would actually be owning a house or having a bit of money in the bank versus, as you say, overseas properties and investments? What's, yeah, yeah. Can you just define the two in a, in, in a nutshell? Uh, I, I think a simple case would be, uh, say, uh, say a, a mum has passed away and, and she's elderly, husband passed away years ago, uh, the house is in her sole name, the estate in total is worth less than 325000 because that's the IHT, th- sorry, inheritance tax threshold. Uh, and it's all going to, say, one son or, or, or a son and a daughter. And that's that's relatively straightforward. Yeah. There's there's nothing really uh, screaming at you saying, oh, there's, there's something going on here. And uh, they can process it themselves, you know, relatively easy. It, it takes a long time now because obviously the probate courts are still far behind because of COVID, you know. And, are they? And it's, you know, it's at least sort of six to nine months, uh, in some cases, 12 months. What takes. happens to all the stuff? It just sort of sits there, really, you know, especially if it's investments or property. I mean, you know, we'd always encourage people to get, if they're going to sell the property, get it on the market at least, get it up to scratch and, and then, you know, market it. Uh, but we still got to wait for the grant ultimately before it can be signed over. Uh, so, uh, again, it's it's it's... It's a thoughtful thing that someone's done to try and tidy up their own affairs so it's not a burden for, for someone. And you can do all that without a will. You know, you can die what they call intestate. So there's no will, but then you follow the laws of the land. And that always doesn't uh, make sense because even if you're a husband and wife, you don't automatically get everything from the, the other partner's estate. Yeah, I, I, wanted to just, I wanted to ask, you mentioned the inheritance tax. Um, and I think we can segue in maybe on that comment just sort of having a will versus not having a will in regard to your estate, things like taxes and, and to your mm. comment, then who gets what? I mean, I'm sure, I feel like there's definitely going to be benefits to having a will in regard to that sort of stuff. But yeah. is is there anything sort of really glaringly obvious that is a, is a negative in, in relation to sort of things like income, um, sorry, inheritance tax, if, if you don't have a will? Like how does that, how, how is that impacted? Yeah, I, I think inheritance tax is just just there, you know, at the okay. levels it is, and and you can get what they call the uh, residential nil rate band, which is everyone's entitled to three hundred twenty five thousand in the in the UK. Tax, what, you pay no ta- you pay no yeah, tax on that. Yeah, and there's no tax between spouses. Does so. that count? Into, does that take into account everything? So, uh, for example, like gold what, rings, you know. Yeah, you know, if they got art, I don't yeah. know, and, and things yeah. like that in the house, does it? Do they? Does someone? Does someone come in and check all that? It needs to be valued, you know, and so it's declared to HMRC, and uh, and they can work out what that tax due is on it. Okay. We we do it as professionals anyway, but we can ask that for their input. Uh, and then uh, if you're if you're a couple and you've got wills in place, and uh, you want to maximise your your, your tax free allowance. Uh, everyone's entitled as a couple to a million pounds now. Not not a lot of people know that. So you get three hundred twenty five thousand each, and then if you're passing your house on to you know your next what they call lineal descendants, so children and grandchildren that sort of thing, then the uh, the government and HMRC have said you can have an extra hundred and seventy five thousand each. So all of a sudden you've gone from three two five as an individual, double that up because you're a couple, and then you get your so you're at six fifty. And then you get your 175,000 each on the death of the second of you, uh, takes up to a million pounds. So if you've got an estate worth a million pounds in the UK, you don't pay any tax. You shouldn't pay any tax. And if you do, uh, what's going on there? You know what? Is this something? Uh, you know, again, I, coming no, I, left I, I didn't know that either. Did you? I've never heard of that either. No. And when you try, when you say couple, is, you, is that married couples? Yeah, or civil partnership. Right. Yeah, okay. So. What's a civil partnership? Uh, same sex. And, okay. Uh, yeah. But they're still also, married. Yeah. There's yeah. also the other sort of relationship as well, now, isn't there? Where it's not it's not a formal marriage. I think a couple took it to court a year or so. Well, I think ago. you've got the co-parent or not co-parenting. Is that separation? But it's co-inhabiting. Is that? Is that the same sort of thing now? No, there's got to be some formal connection. Right, okay. you know, and uh, I think that's where people get 
at loss sometimes because I've heard that before. Like, oh, if you cohabit with someone for seven years or something like that, then you're entitled to X amount. But I, I think that's all a bit of a myth. Seven years is always thrown around, you know. You, yeah, you that's know, what I mean. You hear it. Anyone, like, yeah, they, they'll talk about seven years. So seven years really is if you've got a gift in your estate or you've got an asset in your estate today, if you give it away and you, you take no further benefit from it. So let's say, let's say £100,000 in a savings account and you decide to give that away to, to a third party, you know, nephews, nieces, cousins, whatever. Uh, you've got to survive seven years before that becomes outside of your estate and it's tax free. That's that's the scenario. So that's what the seven years is about. What's the what's the tax price on that? You know, so if it's a say, like, what's the what's the percentage of tax you'd pay? It, it's forty percent like? inheritance tax. Is so, it? So again, these are sort of in isolation things we're talking 40%, about. Forty percent. So you're yeah, paying yeah. the super tax on it. it. It's you know. But but you've got to look at the, there's other strategies to try and mitigate tax, you know, yeah. because there's there's all sorts of things you can do. I mean, we use financial advisors to do some of the tax planning on things like the AIM market. So you can have an asset and, and if it uh, passes through your financial advisor and it's the right thing to put it on the AIM market because it's more volatile than the FTSE, uh, within two years, those assets become tax free. Now, if you're... You know, it sounds awful, but if you're late in the day, as it were, you, you know, you're very mature and getting on in years and you may not think you've got seven years, why wouldn't you look at that as a strategy? Mm -hmm. Now, we don't advise on that. We say you need to take appropriate financial advice and here's the person to, to help you in that in that respect. But it's a, it's a known strategy to use, you know. And what's the AIM market, sorry, Trev? AIM is the alternative investment market. So it's like a secondary market to the, to the footsies, you know, so... Uh, it, it's a great tool, and there's many firms that offer those investment vehicles. But like I said they're they're more. Is, risky. It, is, it a, is it a low risk or a high risk? You say? I, I think it's it's a higher risk overall. Okay. But, but you know, from what I understand, it's not it's not about trying to make money on those markets. It's about trying to mitigate the the, 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 tax. the tax liability. Yeah. So some people look at that, you know. Mm -hmm. But again, a good IFA will deal with that, and uh, that's good, that's we good. just know of it, and we know it's a tool. But because we're not licensed as financial advisors, we would pass that to uh, to them to, yeah. to deal with. Okay. Uh, and just just to clarify a point you made a second ago. So if if I'm alive and I give a uh, hundred grand to my son, for example, mm. I need to live for seven years so he doesn't do. get so he doesn't pay inheritance tax. Is that right? That's correct. Right. Yeah. I got you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but let's let's just, let's, on a bit. let's let's also draw this up because when you talk to clients, they rightly or wrongly assume that that uh, that seven years it goes down by a seventh every year. So if you if you ended up dying in year three, and you've given that money away, lots of clients think, well, that's three sevenths of tax that I've saved on the forty percent. Well, the 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 tax sort of uh, uh, charge doesn't start until year four. So what they're trying to stop there is people at the last minute trying to trying to give things away. So, so it then reduces over the last four years. So from year four to seven, that's when you get the savings on tax. So if you died in year two, there is no tax savings, even though it's been outside of your estate for two years. You know, as it's a such gift, a high amount of tax in it. For oh, them, so. it's it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a huge. Like I thought maybe like twenty five percent. You know, yeah, no, yeah, I think it was around there. Yeah, yeah. I don't know it's forty percent. I think the other thing to think about as well is you know uh, you've worked long and hard for this. And, and clients, rightly so, want to retain as much as they can. Most people don't mind paying tax overall. The people that we meet, they feel it's it's the right thing to do as a, you know, as a citizen. And we all do it, don't we? But, yeah, but you've already paid it on what you earn in the first place. Yeah, You're paying yeah it I, know, I know. There is that debate. It's... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, and pensioners family. feel like that as well yeah. because they, you know, they've they've saved up most of their lives to put towards a pension, and then they're retired, and obviously their income is reduced generally, you know, from their their working days, and then they're taxed on that, and and it's it it does seem harsh, mm -hmm. but it's it's the law, isn't it? You know, it's not not a lot we can do about that. Mm -hmm. All we can try and do is is try and plan ahead, you know, plan ahead for things like sadly, what well, we're all going to go death. Uh, taxes are going to be there and and to plan for whilst you're alive as well because you know that's probably one of the other things that, to bring up which i think is more important than wills powers of attorney they're the most important documents because you know as you you, you know sadly might have seen over the last couple of years uh kate garraway was a presenter on good morning britain sadly her husband through uh through the covid period went into a coma and there's been all sorts of issues i think uh, there was she made a fantastic documentary that won a bafta uh, and it really sort of brought home. It was very sad for that family, what they had to go through. But because of her position in society and, and, and media, uh, it told people that, you know, even people like us, you know, probably well-informed, got advisors, 
uh, we struggled with it all because you didn't have a power attorney in place. You you can't make decisions for your partner, for your husband, wife, you know, whatever. So, so that's what a power attorney is. It's, it's making a yeah. decision for your spouse or for someone else, basically. It is. It's, it's a document that says, you know, whilst I'm fit and well, I know who I would trust to run my affairs and make decisions in my best interest, you know, in my family generally. And, uh, and that document goes through a court, which is the Office of the Public Guardian, and, and it ratifies that you made this while you're fitting well. You decide it's going to be this person or you're going to have a backup reserve attorney and they will basically step in to run your affairs for you, whether that's paying bills, uh, running businesses, and that's why you need a business power of attorney, uh, or your health and welfare, because there are two documents. One is for health and welfare. So uh, that's just as important as the financial one, but people lean on the financial one a bit because they understand the pain of not a bill being paid or something, you know. And you know what it's like now. You go on and try and change, talk to someone about changing their mobile phone contract or, yeah. or, or the gas, and, and it's, it's crazy because they'll say, sorry, we can't deal with you. Yeah, so imagine when that person is totally incapacitated. They've lost their mental capacity or, or they're just so unwell, they're in hospital and they can't deal with anything. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're important documents, you know. And we urge all clients. We actually ask clients to sign a disclaimer on that now. Okay. What, to say that you've... We told you about it. it. It's yeah. really important. I know you're here for your will and all the rest of it, but that's very, very important. Just, um, just being really morbid here, but if someone's in a coma, would that same person also be the person who would make the decision around whether the, the machine gets switched off or not? That's correct, it would yeah. Be okay. And there is a question in there on the health and welfare power of attorney that says, is, is the decision to be made by your attorney... Or, or attorneys, or is it to be made by the medical team, basically? And, uh, and and people make that choice. And people usually feel quite strongly about it one way or the other, you know. And there's no right or wrong answer, is it? It's just you're giving that authority to someone. Uh, and there's there's pros and cons with both of those decisions. Yeah. Uh, but it's down to the individual to, to make their mind up, you know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's, yeah, I know. See, but this is the, this is the subject. I love it. This is great. Do, do you know what? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm learning. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's why I'm quiet, mate. I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, it's great. For once, you've shut me up. <laughs> <laughs> but that is a it's first, isn't it? Yeah, it is How long have I known you? And that's like, <laughs> it's a fucking so first, mate. It's uh, it's one of those things as well. I think you know we don't want to be making these decisions or helping people make decisions when it's late in the day. You know, so when someone's been diagnosed with a life limiting illness or terminal illness. Uh, or as we've done sometimes, we you know we visit St Luke's and see people who are not well. That's not the time to be doing it. And we we deal with it with as much empathy and care as we can because I believe part of our DNA DNA is kindness in our firm, and that's what makes us different. And we don't want to be having those conversations at that point. Don't leave it till then. Let's just get the blooming thing done. You know, it it takes an hour of your time. You know, we've all got all these hours every week, and I know we're all busy living you know balanced or trying to live balanced lives. But this is important. Get it done. Stop looking what the next mobile phone is you're going to buy. Stop looking at the Sky packages. You know? uh, stop worrying about all those things, you know, because they're, they're not life affecting, really, are they? I mean, you might have a better mobile phone, but yeah. just put a document in place or documents that help your family because we all care for it, you know, our own and we all love them. And uh, and yet we leave this wide open. That's what I was going to say. I, I think a lot of people just... Oh, we'll do it another time. Like I always think that when, when we talk about something, like I think, well, I'm 33, like I'll, I'll do it another time. And speaking to family members and I say to them about their wills and about stuff like this and, and they'll go, oh yeah, I'll get around to it. I'll get around to it. And, you, and yeah, I'll do it tomorrow. And that's it. And they never seem to just get off their ass yeah. really and do I it. It's and, just, I think it seems to be human nature though, doesn't yeah. it? And then maybe it's just how busy we are these days. I don't know. Maybe a yeah. four day a week would help, huh? Do you know, maybe <laughs> there's a, there's an idea there. Yeah. <laughs> But I think we've talked about it already with fitness and health. It's yeah. like people wait till they're sick before they actually fucking do anything. You know what I mean? And yeah. it's just, it's mad, isn't it? It is crazy. But it is what it is. Yeah. Um, storage vaults. Yeah, what, basically. Just, you've gone to the trouble of putting this in place. Yeah. And then what you decide to do, this most important document or documents, and then you decide to stick it in the drawer at home, in the kitchen. <laughs> Lose it. Uh, the number of times, sadly, over the 35 years, we've had clients' children ring up to say, sadly, dad is passed, mum's passed, uh, have you got their will? We know straight away, because obviously we go on our CRM system and it says, no, they took it with them. And we get them to sign for it because if that document's lost and you haven't got the original or it's been tampered with, it's of no use to anyone. And people buy these file boxes, don't they? You know, we've all, we've all got one at home and we stick it in there with the insurance policies. Uh what if there's a fire? What if 
what if your children are going through it one day and they throw things out? What? Just put it in some vaults. It doesn't have to be with us. Of course, we prefer it, but put it in our vaults. My, is, my, my head, I don't know about you, is ringing about like a disgruntled step. Steps so, there yeah. you go. Yeah, so yeah. You have yeah. After yeah. Of going yeah. through it, like yeah, yeah. See, I, later, exactly. I, I must admit, sat sat. I, I I didn't couldn't get my head around what that was because I, I I'm finding it hard to believe that people have a will as a as a paper copy. Mm. I assumed. I know we, you know, going back sort of 15 years, you probably didn't have electronic uh, databases yeah. like we do now, or certainly not to the same level, but. Yeah, I don't know. I just assume that that seems daft to me. Does it, I, is it is it like a, like a tenancy? Do you know like when you buy a house and you get your your documents your for deeds that? Is it, is it your deeds? Yeah, is it the same sort of yeah. thing? It's like a deed, like you get your birth certificate. It's like a, it a legal document that you need to have yeah, in a physical yeah. copy. Is it is it like that? I mean, the probate courts, you know, ideally want the original copy, yeah. untampered, un, undamaged in any Touched, way. You know, yeah. so if if children have spilt coffee all over it, or sweet. have you had? I know you probably can't talk. Have you had any? things where people have like rang you up and said oh it's just gone missing and you think that someone's yeah. taken it and stuff like that you know and you think like you know the 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 step mum or something is, yeah, yeah. is oh it's gone missing yeah i'll get all his stuff yeah. and i'm <laughs> yeah. sad to say uh it's normally blended families you know yeah that's that's like, what i'm said, thinking I'm part yeah. one uh it, it's it's one of those things where you you just say to clients at the outset look you know you, you want to make sure that this person you know inherits uh, there could be a threat in the wing somewhere, you know? And if it's in someone's interest, it's, as you said earlier, Paul, you know, where they stumble across it and think, I'm not even in there, Pfft, destroy. And where's the proof that it was ever there or ever destroyed? You come to a company like ours and we'd say, yeah, of course, we did this document, 14th of May, 2001. Here's what we've got. The, the courts want to see the original. They don't want to see us just talk. You can do an affidavit, which will help a court in terms of, uh, you know, evidence in what, what's gone on, but yeah. they want the document. That's that's what they want. That's the proof, isn't it? That's That was your will. That was your intent to do this. Do you ever advise people to give people stuff in a will to keep them happy? Does that make sense? So say like you've got like an estate and then you think there may be a problem or they've told you there might be a problem with a stepchild or a step person. If you give them something, then they can't claim on other stuff. Is that, is that a thing? Yeah. So I mean, yeah, yeah, like uh, I've heard that before. That's all like they are. They give them like yeah. a picture that's yeah. worth like a thousand pounds rather than giving them 50. Th yeah. And they've got their reasons. <laughs> haven't they? So, so that, that's another issue altogether. And that's on the increase massively contentious probate. So if you think about it, if you were, if you had two siblings mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they got everything when mum or dad died, and you you got a fiver. You're going to be pretty disgruntled, aren't you? Yeah. Of course, and there's yeah. there's an act called the 75 Act, which is for inheritance uh, provision of dependents. So that means if you're you're a spouse, for example, you can't just be left out of your husband's will or wife's will. Uh, if you're a former spouse and uh, you didn't have a clean break divorce, or uh, you know you never remarried. Then uh, you know there, there's there's elements there you can claim. If you never remarried, yeah, it's a long story. We won't go into it oh, now. Oh God, because there's there's other Crazy. ramifications with it and things. Yeah, like. I can imagine. Yeah. But also, if if you obviously if you're a child, you know, if you're an offspring of this person, they're, they're part of their bloodline. Or the other one is if you've got dependency on someone. So you imagine if you uh, let someone live in your house for a number of years and you paid the mortgage or the rent or whatever and bought all their food and their clothes, you you basically drop dead and you've left them nothing in your will. That's a bit harsh because all of a sudden they could be out on the street. They've got nothing to go on. The court would say you need to make reasonable provision for someone. So where you talk about leave them a fiver, you know, for example, or a picture, uh, there are cases of those all over the place, but there's so many incorrect sort of uh, urban myths going around. Yeah, cool. You know, you, you hear the classics. Yeah, again, Fred down the pub. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, what my mate Fred did was he said if he leaves a pound to his son because he loves his daughter, she's amazing. She sees him every week. The son has, you know, not been a good son. And uh, it's not going to work, is it? I mean, you can have uh, what they call no contest clauses in, in, in wills now. Uh, well, they've been around for a long time, but they sort of fell out of favour. But they're, they're coming back to the fore. We, we, we were on a webinar with it the other day where, you know, if, if you put a no contest clause in your will, if you say, say your estate is 300,000 yeah. and you've decided to leave uh, two thirds of it to your daughter and one third to your son. If there's a no contest clause in there, it means if he tries to challenge the will, he's at risk potentially of losing that 100,000. So that's worth thinking about. Isn't it? If you're, you know, depending on what their position is. If you'd left him a tenner and she got £299,900, 
then why wouldn't you go for it? You've got nothing to lose. And, and there are lawyers out there now, specialists in that field. We work with some of them who uh, give great advice on this because people are more contentious. There's, there's more broken families. There's more blended families. There's, there's all, all sorts of issues going on. And, and uh, you know, as, as in the old days of no win, no fee, you know, mm. pe- lawyers are out there. They're looking for business. And if they can challenge a will, then they're looking for disgruntled beneficiaries. Yeah. So when you give advice, you've you got to... You've got to paint the whole picture. You can't just say, it'll be all right, just leave them there. No, no, we look at the whole picture and say, look, at this is the scenario, and we document what we say and what we advise. But uh, it's just doing the right thing, I guess. You mentioned a no contest clause. Mm. Um, why wouldn't everybody just have that as standard in their will? That's a really good question. Uh, and I'm not saying that just to buy time to answer it. Uh, it's, it's one of those things where lots of practitioners uh, don't know about them. Uh, their their level of uh, qualification or no qualification and their level of education is not up to where it should be in terms of estate planning. Lots of solicitors typically will know about them if they specialise in, in estate planning and trust and things like that. But they sort of fell out of fashion, really. Uh, it was more a case of trying to present to a client a more balanced sort of approach to how they distribute their estate, which is upsetting for some clients. You know, if you've, if you've had a son, I don't know, who was a drug addict or was violent to you or violent to your family and um, not a good person in society and and you've had no contact and you haven't seen them 30 years you'd probably think well I don't I don't want him to have anything uh, but you know the law is a funny thing and you know it, it, it looks for fairness and and if you leave them out of your will altogether that's not fair so you've got to try and balance it does up that, with, does, is that the same with like stepchildren so if they're not the the biological father, is it you know? Does that does I, I'm just thinking of like broken families and stuff like that. There's a lot of people. So say like you had a a step a step son for example that you hadn't seen for ten years. You know he's left the family. Don't talk to anyone. And then you know the the, the dad dies or whatever. And then he's got you know stepson. The mother maybe has already passed, but then steps on, and then they got one maybe regular child. Yeah, it it, it is difficult, Dan, because uh, you know once the, the the actual parent, the bloodline parent, is gone, is you know you think a couple have got together. Maybe there's two children from one side, one from the other, and they're a blended family. Who's to say that if if one of them dies first, that they're going to look after all three children because they've been raised as three together? In, in yeah, many cases. that was my question. Yeah, they they're all a family, yeah. but then so the situation is if there's no will and uh, and there are stepchildren in the family and that person dies, the stepchildren get nothing. They're not recognised in law, you know, which is quite harsh because if you've been brought up, you know, uh, you know, I've had stepchildren, as you know, I've got yeah. stepchildren. Uh, it, it, it's quite harsh because you're, you're a family, aren't you? You're a unit. Uh, so more than ever, blended families need wills, yeah? Mm-hmm. Definitely people who are not married or people who've been married before and, and all that sort of stuff and you've got children. Uh, the only way to stop that is, is with a will because if I want to recognise a stepchild, I, I will put it in my will that it says I want this amount of money or this percentage of my estate to go to that person because, you know, I love them, trust them, part of my family, our family. Uh, but if you don't have that in place, it's difficult. And if a stepchild then, if they're left out of, of, a, of, a, of an estate, they have to go through the 75 Act and start saying and evidencing that they were maybe promised something, which is called proprietary estoppel, or they were dependent on that that, that parent, step-parent. And, it, it, you know, it's a can of worms, the whole thing. So that's why we keep coming back to this point about just get it done properly in the first place. And you got none of these issues. Yeah, you, you literally hear about just people dying and the family just going to war over the estate as well, don't you? You can see how it happens now. Yeah, you yeah. really can. They fall out big time over it as well. And even if they didn't, they got on great before, you know, just money is the root of all evil sometimes, isn't it? You know, and it's greed and, uh, you know, what they think they deserve on. But, but, in- e- but equally, that, that said, that, that's kind of always what I thought people just want more. But actually, from what Trev's saying, it sounds like some people are literally just, un, you know, unknowingly to the person who's died, just left out in the cold financially. Oh, yeah. And they're yeah. literally probably fighting for their lives, you know what I mean? So, I, I, yeah, I completely understand why, why it gets as messy as it does. Of course, there are people who just greedy gets in and probably want more Absolutely. than they're entitled yeah, to. Yeah. But, anyhow. I mean, one of the things we'll touch on there before we, we move on mm. is... is uh, that situation where you've got a couple and even if, you know, they've got children between them and they've never been married to anyone else, it's just a, you know, a 2.4 children sort of scenario, which is getting more and more rare, isn't it, as, as we go on. Uh, 
if if say 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 the the husband died first and he died prematurely in his thirties, well, you would hope that most people would want their partner to go on and have another life. You know, some people wouldn't. You know, but uh, but how can you guarantee that the the three children you had between you are going to in- inherit from your hard work? Because you know you went out to work like as maybe as your wife did, uh, and you want to make sure that they benefit. Because the issue is, if the surviving widow goes on and marries a 25-year-old Spaniard called Juan from Benidorm, uh, or Pedro, uh, and comes back. We know a story about that, Dan, don't we? Uh, uh, comes back, and, and they, they get married. Uh, that revokes the existing will. So the wife of uh, the, the gentleman who's died yeah. has now got a new spouse in law. Uh, there is no will, because marriage cancels all wills, revokes all wills, unless you put a certain clause in. Okay. Yeah. So see where we go. So, so you've what, got a what, what's, what's that clause called? <laughs> it's called a, a non-revocation of marriage clause. So that means, uh, like couples typically who are, who are just couples at the moment and they've got no intention to get married, we still recommend put it in your own will because if you have that mad moment in Cyprus or or you you're right, you're on holiday or you go to Gretna Green and you think oh we're going to get married. We'll do it, but at least your will will still be in place. You've still got those same intentions, because if you get married without that will, uh, or without that clause in a will, then you've got no will, have you? And then all of a sudden you're intestate without knowing it. And that's not good. But that's one issue. So, so there's all these complications, you know. That is amazing. Uh, but, but the key thing is, you, you can write a will in such a way where you can put trust planning in there that says, so if we deal with the main house, let's take that as a typical sort of main asset for most people. I, I die yesterday. My share of the house, I can change how it's owned at Land Registry, my share of the house will be of use to my wife going forward for the rest of her days. And, you know, she can move and downsize all the rest of it. Uh, there'll be trustees involved in this, you know, of which she may be one. Uh, but what it says ultimately is no matter what she does in the rest of her life, she can never give away my half of the value in that house because it must go to my children. Do you get that? Yeah, it's, it's clever. Think about it. So people think about wills as everything to you, everything to me, then to the children. We always say, do you want to upgrade this? Because here's the situation. We call it a, a, you know, a gold digger trust. Potentially, you, you die, the wife, your husband goes on holiday after he's been grieving for three months to Thailand. You know where we're going, don't you? Uh, we're led astray too easy, us men, apparently. 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 And, 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 you know, a new life. You bring back someone from Thailand and, you, you, you know, you have this exciting new life, a new relationship. Uh, but how is your children protected? And, you know, most people would wa- both of them would want their children protected, wouldn't they? Whatever this person yeah. does well, in the future. You'd, you'd hope so. So let's put some good trust planning in place, you know. That's why you need advice. That's why do not do these £19.99 online wills. Do not go to WH Smith's and buy a pack and then put it in your drawer forever and a day. It never gets done. We've seen, or I personally, I, I, it's hard to put a number on. I've probably seen thousands over the years where I've seen clients over that 35 years where they've gone, oh, I bought this. Yeah, it's been in there 10 years. You know, I meant to do it. Take advice. Do it properly. I just I just had one of my clients. Um, she probably won't mind me saying, but she her, her mum and her dad passed away last year, but they were separated. But her dad passed away and he had remarried and had like another family. Uh, yeah, had another family. So she's got her and her sister and then she's got two stepsisters. So, but the 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 new family with the mum, obviously she was left with the house and all the bits and pieces and all that sort of stuff. Some of their, uh, uh, some of her, some of her dad's possessions have just gone missing like Rolexes and things like that. But the house was supposed to be 50, 50% theirs and 50% of her children when they passed away. Well, what she's done is she's gone and she's moved and sold the house straight away, but they didn't have a strong enough will by the looks of it that what you were saying that so now that house is gone the, the new house is now not hers so yeah so now they're trying to she's she's basically offered them 20 percent. that's what's happened now so that she's fighting like tooth and nail now with that but she that so it's exactly what you're saying you know what i mean so they've not got that in place her dad skinted on a will that's exactly what she said. He's getting it on will. I think he'd done one of those packs or something yeah. like yeah. that. You know, I'm just right got a really there. basic will said, you know, 50% of the house goes to my daughters when I pass away. Um, obviously maybe when his, his spouse 
when she when she passed away, you know, then it goes 50-50 or whatever. But what she's done is she's straight away gone and sold the house, all their assets, stuff's gone missing, and then she's only left with, you know, and to, what, what can she do? Do you know what I mean? At this point, she's like... And there'll be a lot of fees and a lot of time and a lot of... You it's know, already it's cost crazy. it. It's already cost her loads of money. It's crazy. And, uh, and even our solicitor now and, and yeah. what she's dealing with is saying yeah. like, you know, if you go to yeah. court, it's going to cost you thousands. Yeah. And she hasn't really got the money with that. No, and no. it's just like... Pfft. But it's that thing in life. We all know, don't we? If we... It was it buy, be, buy cheap, buy twice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the trouble is with wills or, or any legal instrument like that is you're dead. Yeah. You haven't got a chance to put it right, you know? So... Don't leave an even bigger mess by doing it on the cheap, you know? I mean, sometimes they say no will is better than a will because if the will is not good and it's not not doing what it needs to do, it causes all sorts of problems. Again, I'll keep saying, come back, use professionals, you know? That's that's the only way forward. And there's lots of people out there, sadly, who claim they're professionals. They're, they're not, they no qualification. <laughs> yeah. you, you see it in your industry, you know, it's... Oh, yeah, well, we, we, we talk about that all the time, mate. What, we have because a little rant on, on people that have just got a six-pack and they, they say they know what they're yeah, on. Yeah, look about, at me, you know? I'm, I'm a, a personal trainer. You think, well, <laughs> you've done no training, you've got no yeah. education, you don't know about nutrition, you know? I know yeah. I'm the last one to work nutrition, but, <laughs> you know, in all honesty, just go to a pro, isn't it? And, and check them out, check their Google reviews, see what they're all about. Mm-hmm. Uh, have they got premises? You know, because that's 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 a big clue to me. If you're in law and you haven't got premises, uh, what's going on there? What you work from a back bedroom? So what's that all about? I know people work hybrid. Don't get me wrong, but I think in the legal profession, people need to be able to go somewhere, don't they? And, and, yeah, and check you it's out. That, it's the whole package, isn't it? You yeah, know, you got to be able to to be able to provide for them and be able to sit there in a nice office yeah. and, you know, yeah. if they're paying you good money for good advice and you've got to be in a nice setting, I think. Yeah. And where's the longevity of the business, you know, because people, you're talking about a product because it is at the end of the day, it's a product or service whereby you're, you're taking advice today. You're trusting that person to do something for you, you put it in place and then, you won't find out there's a problem until 30 or 40 years later. Is, is that firm yeah. still around? I mean, that's one <laughs> exactly. proud of our longevity. Yeah. We're here a long time. And when I started the business all those years ago, people used to say to me, because obviously I was a young guy, I'm like 22, people used to say, how do we know you're going to be around? And and what could I say? I said, you just got to trust me, mm, yeah. you know, unless God takes me soon, you know, uh, I'll be around because this is, this is my career path. I'll build a business. Just trust me, please. Yeah. And lots of as I thought were old people then in their fifties, uh, <laughs> did trust me, and I'm forever grateful for them. You know, and uh, but it's 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 a difficult thing because you want to know that that document's there at the right time when it's needed, and and if it's some firm that you know here today gone tomorrow, that's no good to your family, is it? Yeah, absolutely. You know? Trev, we we definitely want to drill into um, the qualifications that you need to do your job and and where you started mm. in your business. Before we do that, I've still got a couple of questions, okay. if I may, because. <laughs> uh, it's yeah, a boring topic, I, feel like, I know. No, you, you know, say this boring, I fucking love it, mate. No, I, I just know the I next time yeah. we have a conversation, I'll probably be paying for it, okay. so I thought I'd take advantage now. Right. <laughs> um, with, uh, with the wheel, first of all, it, you, you get it done, you go and see someone like mm. yourself, get it done, and then I, I hear about this all the time, and you're like, oh, you're out the wheel, that's it, I've had enough of you. Oh, yeah. Is that quite easy to change? Like, if you need to change your wheel, do they just pop back and see you? Is it quite a quick process? Yeah, yeah it is, yeah. yeah. I mean, we... Uh, we're in the process at the moment of trying to review all, all the clients' wills from, you know, the year dot, really. And uh, most of them come back to us, you know, most of our clients. Because we, we we measure every every week what we do. We have what we call a level 10 meeting. Everyone sits down and we look at the stats for the week. And every week, without fail, it tells us where our three main sort of areas of business are. And two of them involve either existing clients coming back to us to change things or it's existing clients recommending someone else. Mm. So that's that's a brilliant tool, isn't it? Yeah. And, and if you were starting out in that business now, it's tough because, you know, there's lots of competition and what have you. But for us, that works really well. But they can change it relatively quickly. Yeah. But we look at their whole setup, you know, because somebody will come to you and say, oh, I moved a dress three years ago. I meant to tell you, can you update it? Of course we'll update the will, but we'll take it as an opportunity to say, what else has changed? Yeah. Do you, are you proactive? Do you sort of, I know like my dentist will let me know if I need to check up. Do you do something similar? Do you contact yeah. people and say, it's been a year or two years, that's come back and have We do. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's and quite cool. often you won't hear anything, you know, but that, at least they know you're there. And, and we send things out like monthly e-shots to clients. And we always say, and we won't bombard you with stuff, you know, we, we get it. Sometimes wills and, and estate planning is seen as quite transactional, whereas we try and make it a bit more relationship-based, you know. So that's why, you know, our partnerships with like Argyle and, and Patriots uh, is great. And the Theatre Royal, because mm-hmm. we we can invite them to inv- events, we can give out old tickets here and there and just so they're always in touch with us and uh it, it's it's important that they have those touch points because 
sometimes people will genuinely not want to see you ever again. Will they? It's done. I'm moving on. I get that, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, that, yeah. But a lot of them do, and they're lovely people. You know, most of our clients are lovely people, even though they might be in tough times when they see us sometimes. I guess um, you must see as well people that are progressing at different stages of their life, which must yeah. be quite fun to see. So you might see someone at 30 when they're yeah. maybe starting their business and they're doing quite well and maybe yeah, getting yeah. their wheel and bits and pieces in place. And you see them like maybe like, obviously we've been doing it a while, 10 yeah, years yeah. later and now yeah. they're like fucking yeah. well off, got <laughs> five houses. Things change. Houses yeah. And then you're like, oh yeah, yeah. that's gone from a simple yeah. uh, estate to a complex estate. Yeah, so right. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then you probably have that journey with a few, yeah, you few do. customers and that must be nice to see. Oh, it's, it's lovely because you, you know, you, you do get to know people quite well and, uh, and the the strangest thing for me though is is starting it so young, and how did you even start? I was twenty two when I started, you know, and uh, and it was one of those things where it, it's quite it's seen as quite an old man sort of thing, I guess, you know, wheels and that. But uh, it, it's that thing where when you were seeing clients when you were in your twenties and thirties and even your forties, they're saying, you know, they're, they're saying, oh, could you be my executor, for example? And I said, well, yeah, yeah it'd be an honour if you want us to, if there's no one else in the family. Uh, whereas now it's the opposite. They're now saying to me, we don't know if you're going to go before us. <laughs> and I'm going, yeah, you're probably right, you know, but uh, especially yeah. the younger ones, you yeah, know, the yeah. ones in their 30s, it's, uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a weird thing. But it's lovely to see people do really well in life. And uh, and I'm all for people doing well, you know. Uh, you know, this thing, it's... Uh, we're only here for a short while, aren't we? You know, all of us. And and if you can do that good sort of things in, in society while you're here, and I don't want to be all evangelical about it, but it's it's like, let's put some back, you know, and that's what we do as a firm. And I think it's lovely to see people do well, encourage them, give them opportunities, yeah. you know, whatever think, walk of life. I think there's enough success to go around. That's yeah. what I always yeah, think. Yeah. There's enough out there. Yeah. The people that want to be successful and want to do well and want to work hard, there's yeah, enough absolutely. out there to be able to do it. Yeah, yeah you know, and It always pisses me off when people are like jealous or hate hate yeah. it towards people about stuff when they're trying to do well and trying to back themselves yeah, so yeah. just let them, let them go yeah they absolutely. fail they fail you know just mm. let them fucking go you know yeah, yeah i know what you're saying yeah definitely um one last but two last questions on inheritance and then we'll uh, inheritance and then we'll, we'll move on to yeah, sure. uh, to your your background mate because i think okay. this sounds like an amazing story um this is this is probably just something that I'm sat here thinking about, which I need to ask. Um, so we're talking about the. I'm inher- worried now. <laughs> no, I'm worried. <laughs> I'm like, Do you want Danny to leave I'm, the room? I'm, I'm, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna preframe this with, with this that that everyone should have a will absolutely. Yeah. Like you've sold it. 100%. Good man. Good man. Um, but if if you've got because you mentioned about the seven year thing, right? So <laughs> this is me just trying to think yeah, sneaky. Yeah. So you've got you've got I don't know fifty grand. You give it to your child, but you've got to survive seven years so you don't pay inheritance tax. If I went and bought a bit of art for fifty grand, and then gave that to my kid, mm. like who would know that he's got that? Like is that a loophole? Well, uh, with whether my, it be watches or anything. Yeah, with my legal hat on. Uh, you should declare everything to the authorities mm-hmm. and uh, be totally above board. Uh, but I, I, we always say to every client, document everything. So if you've made a gift to someone, uh, make a record of it. And I can understand where you're coming from, and we do get that asked that every now and again. But it's it's all about uh, being transparent and, and clear to you know the authorities, what you've got and what you haven't got. And... Uh, because we get clients who have done the other thing. They've given away an awful lot of money over the last uh, seven or 14 years because there's, there's different rules for that. Uh, and uh, if if you're the executor of an estate and you don't know that, uh, you're not reporting it correctly to the, uh, the tax man. So what we would say is any gifts you make over any period of time, write them down. Keep, even keep a little black book or something that you pass to your executors. But uh, the reasons for that is... If you've given away some assets in the last seven years, well, a new seven-year cycle can start again, can't it? Because you've given away that much, so let's do some more. Uh, and there's all tax planning around it, it's t- trust planning. So say they, uh, just, just following what Paul said, if they, um, say they did do that and didn't declare it, but then, you know, say they bought a, a painting or something like that at mm. auction yeah. five years ago, say, £50,000 painting five years ago, given mm. away, didn't declare it, mm. Can the tax man look through your bank, their bank account once they're deceased and go through and go, oh, there's a 25,000 or 50,000 pound painting. Mm. Where is that? Yeah. Does that happen? They can do that... anything they want down there. Yeah. They have, you know, ultimate powers. Yeah. But, but remember, when someone's an executor, they are personally liable to do the right thing. Uh, so okay. even if it was a mistake or you've missed something or you've tried to cover something up, yeah. you know, it's even worse. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
than you're personally liable. So, so where we see situations where somebody has undervalued a house, typically that that's gone on a lot. And I know HMIC have brought a lot of, of uh, new uh, investigators into that area because people were saying genuinely, "Oh, this house is only worth three fifty, and it was clearly. 480 or 5 <laughs> you know but it's gone on it's yeah, gone on and you've imagine, got to be yeah. honest and transparent yeah, yeah. and and uh, and when that liability falls back on an individual yeah. a if they've deliberately done it well they deserve what's coming uh, but if it's a genuine mistake that's a shame and and sorry you know you've never done an executorship before so you are at your depth you've tried to do the right thing but you are personally liable so they can come after you for the for the cash the shortfall you know and again People can do it themselves, as we said at the beginning. We tell everybody that, but it's get better to get a professional involved, especially if there's some complexities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I, I, I had to ask because I know someone's someone's sat at the end of that camera going, "Does yeah. it work? Is it a loophole?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other thing, and, I don't and, think there are any loopholes. No, you know, well, they, they probably got a fucking air tight, and they. Yeah, yeah. You know no, I mean? no, they're yeah. professionals, so you know. Yeah. Um, and, and the last thing, and, and then we'll, we'll we'll move on. But and this is something because my my mum had this, and I don't know if it's really a thing or whether it was a scam or what. But in, inheritance hunters. Oh right, yeah, air air hunters. What yeah. the fuck is yeah. that? <laughs> so so <laughs> someone sounds like a TV show. So, does. <laughs> well, funny enough, <laughs> it is. So That's Trump's new one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so basically, it was a, a scenario where my mum got like a random phone call, yeah. and someone was like, "Right, your second great auntie Doris has died. Mm. You're like the legal next legal beneficiary. Um, we want a percentage yeah. of." this inheritance to basically make it available to you. So tell us about that. Well, it's uh, it's an interesting phenomenon that's probably been around, uh, I'm, I'm guessing now, probably 20 years, on the BBC. It was on early in the mornings and nine o'clock, you know. Uh, and you think about their target audience, you know, predominantly people may have retired or, or not working or, yeah, and much, yeah, yeah and, and they're, they're watching it. And, you know, they do a great job. You know, they, they reunite people with something that the... Uh, the beneficiaries didn't even know was there. So like you said, three times removed, you, there was no will because that's the important thing. So every Thursday morning, the Treasury, HM Treasury, uh, dropped the Treasury list. And that basically says these are the estates that have come up across uh, the country where, uh, you know, there's no beneficiary. Uh, so, so all these companies jump in and they pick the ones that they see has got the biggest amount of money normally. So if there's an estate of 800,000 and they charge a fee of, I don't know what it is these days, 15%, 20%, I don't know. Uh, and they can find these beneficiaries. So they do all the research with their genealogist. The main company that you see on the BBC is uh, Fraser and Fraser. So they do a lot of that. And, and they, they, they track these beneficiaries down. So like with your mum, I mean, if all of a sudden somebody knocks on your door, all of a sudden it's, and it's Friday morning and the list came out the day before, they say, uh, oh, you're entitled to, you know, a, a chunk from this estate, please sign here. Most people will sign because they don't know what the number is, do they? Do they know it's a thousand pounds or is it a million pounds? You're going to get something you didn't expect. That just, that just screams to me, I'm getting scammed. Yeah, yeah it would do. What, what's, just, what's, what's the due diligence that someone could do in that situation? I think with, with companies like Fraser, you know, they, uh, they're very reputable, you know, great firm. Uh, been around a long time. There are one man bands who do it as well. Mm, that's yeah. what I think this lady was who contacted myself. Uh, so right. if, if that happened though, could you say like you were contacted by like a one man band? Could you go to Fraser and Fraser go, is this, is this, oh, legit? definitely. Is yeah. this legit? They would encourage I mean? that though. Yeah. They would encourage it. Some of the others may not because maybe they haven't got a backup. But, you know, if they can evidence that you are the, you know, cousin six times removed of, of Doris who died in the forest of Dean or something, and, and, and you might get 30. 30,000 of it, you, you'd take it every day, wouldn't you? So, so, so where's the, where's the, I'm trying to, I'm trying Paul's, to like, Paul's trying to think now, like, <laughs> she's turned down 800 grand. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, damn it. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I'm just trying to understand, like, maybe it's just, maybe I'm just being cynical and it's the right thing to do, but I'm trying to see what the benefit is from, I guess, the treasury to mm. release that estate and, and then how these companies are entitled to a percentage of it or a commission. That's so, the bit so that I'm, you're giving them a commission. So they're basically giving you, or they're they're find they're finding you, yeah. and then the, you basically their finders fee is the fifteen percent. So they basically say, this is what like we've got this estate for you, yeah. 
<laughs> if you we want know where it, it. So do, yeah, they, do, they, where it do they do they do they almost take ownership of it to some extent then no they so why can't i just bypass them and go to the treasury because you don't know it exists because you don't well, they've just told me that. no they're not they're telling you oh i see somewhere. what you mean i said oh, in right. reverse as it were yeah yeah but then let's say there's potentially 15 beneficiaries you've then got to go and find them yourself right. bef- before the estate and then be also it's having the knowledge of what trev's just said it, does that make sense? Like yeah, knowing yeah. there's a list, knowing mm. you know that you can actually search for it yourself. No, I, I'm thinking a step further on. So someone's actually been in touch, and knocked on your door, and so there's some uh, there's, a, there's an estate waiting for you. <laughs> Give yeah. us like twenty percent. I bet no thanks. I'll just go get the estate. But what they don't tell you is who that person is. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I believe. Okay. You know? right. Because they'll, they'll, they'll that yeah they'll keep yeah. that to themselves. That it's possible you're a potential beneficiary in yeah. an estate yeah. of a relative. And you, right. you could get up to. Fifty thousand yeah. mm. pounds. Yes. So sign here. You know. Yeah. I, I don't oh. know if it's straightforward. Yeah. It looks that straightforward on television. But the the amount they've invested in genealogist tools and and the staff and premises and yeah, it's a lot. But they they have guys all over the country. They'll just ring them up and say, so say it was down here. We found that Doris had her cousin six times removed living in Padstow. Here's the address. Can you get to the house? So it's like a mad rush because there could be other genealogists <laughs> doing the same thing. That's yeah. what happens. You can see when it's made a TV show. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, do you know what, though? There's some great touching stories on there as well. Because, oh, you know, all this we talk about, documents, money. It? It's all about people, isn't it? Yeah. It's people, you know. And, uh, yeah, and life change for some people. Yeah, you can imagine some old yeah. lady who's, like, struggling mm. and just getting 50 grand given to yeah. her, so, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I wanted to ask because I... I'd I wasn't familiar with the TV show and I just... Did, did she not go through with it, no? No, she got she did get some money, oh, but it's okay. one of these things, it's like, could, could, could there have been more? But yeah, she was happy enough. She was fine. But I think it was a bit of a, I think it was just a bit of a headache at the time trying to just communicate with this yeah, person yeah. and everything else. It got a tad messy, but ultimately she got some money which she didn't have before. So, yeah. all good. Yeah. All right, let's, let's move on. That was that was great, mate. That was, um, yeah, I think really interesting and then so much good content in regard to why people really need to speak to somebody like yourself. Um, but on that point, you, you mentioned um, about qualifications and credibility. And, mm-hmm. and I guess that's the next burning question, isn't it? Yeah. We, we've, we've got a really clear understanding now of, of why people need to speak to a legal professional. But again, it's finding the right one. So I guess what would be nice is if you've, you've given us little snippets, you, you've kind of been in the, you know, you've run the company now for 22 years, so 30, 35 years, starting at 22. Um, you've worked with loads of people. You're now sponsored to, um, you know, some of the local sports teams, Plymouth Argyle, Patriots. Um, so I guess tell us kind of how you got into it, the journey to where you are now, and along the way, to fill in some of the blanks, I guess, around the qualifications and what makes people credit, yeah. what makes you credible. I, I think if we start with that bit first, because I'm uh, I'm seen as a uh, how can I put this. I'm quite vociferous about this nationally, you know, because I, I feel it's wrong that if people are paying for advice that they perceive is from a legal person, then that person should surely hold legal qualifications. Will writing in the UK is uh, is unregulated, so it's like the Wild West at times. You well, can completely, st- yeah, yeah. You can start a will writing business tomorrow, uh, having been in prison for the last five years. <laughs> Because there's no law in place. So I, I've been very fortunate during the years. I, I've sat on the Legal Services Board in London where we investigated this. Uh, I'm chair of the Best Foundation, which is a, you know, a new succession planning sort of organisation that looks to, to raise standards. Uh, we, as a firm, you know, our people giving advice are step qualified. Now, step is the Society of Trust and State Practitioners. It's a global qualification. So if somebody's got TEP after their names, they are the best, you know. Uh, We've got an apprentice that started with us nine years ago. She's just qualified. So to go from an apprentice to become gold worldwide standard is amazing. I'm so proud of her. Uh, But that's the, the standard we want. We won't let anyone in front of a client that's not got any qualification. What's that all about? But we don't have to have people with qualifications. Anyone can give the advice. you just got to make sure you've got the right professional indemnity insurance to cover up the mistakes that they're highly likely to make. You know? So we always say, we have a joke about it, you know, in terms of nationally amongst people who are the same level as us, where uh, you can be a window cleaner in the afternoon and then go and advise someone on their £2 million estate in the evening. And because you've got legal in your name or something, they, the public are unaware. Oh, I, never, so I never knew it's that. It's awful. That's, that's, that's terrifying me. I had no idea either. The things either. to look for, honestly, are things like... But I don't think people know that in general. No, they like, don't. They don't know they that don't. because you would never think that that would be unregulated. Mm. No. Something so important would be unregulated. Yeah. So there's reserved activities in law 
uh, like drawing up legal instruments, uh, you know, trust deeds, uh, things like probate and uh, obviously conveyance, you know, all those sorts of things. So only qualified lawyers can carry those out. Things like wills, because you can write your own will, you know, it's it's unregulated, isn't it? You're doing your own thing. You're not, you're not a qualified lawyer. But we always say to people, look, look for a few things. You know, one of the things is if you see someone with TEP after their name, trust and estates practitioner, they are the best. They are gold standard. And step are trying to get that message out to the public. But it's a hard sell because some people just want cheap and nasty. Then, you know, certainly solicitors who are specialists in this field, so they've got their law degree. They don't always do a, a, a huge amount on their law degree courses or their, their seats, as they call them, as they're, as they're training on the training contracts on wills and probate. But, you know, you're, you're in good hands there. They're regulated. You know, that's fine. Uh, the other thing to look for is someone who's Silex. So that's a Chartered Institute of Legal Executives. So they're always seen unfairly, I think, at times as like secondary to solicitors. And yet they do a lot of the work of, of the solicitor's practice. And so anybody with Silex, fantastic. So those are the three things to look for. If anybody has got anything else, you need to question it because they're the only truly sort of three areas of law in, in our field, anyway, our state planning sector, where it's got real credibility. The problem you've got these days is... Facebook with £19.99 wheels, and it's just a call centre. Or you've got things like uh, people who are very good on social media. They've got great TikTok accounts. They've got great websites. Look at me, how clever I am. If you do this in law, we can do this for you, you know. So people buy into it because they assume they're lawyers, and, and they're not, you know. I mean, we've we've employed Mags, our solicitor, in-house for coming up for 10 years ne in next January. Uh, Morgan is TEP qualified. I'm TEP qualified. Uh and we know the advice we give is as good as you can get, you know. And, and if we don't know something, we'll bring in somebody who's TEP qualified or, or somebody with real legal expertise in estate planning or tax planning because you want the best, don't you? So, again, buy cheap, buy twice. So the, there, there's a sector-wide problem. And there are a number of firms like ours around the country who are going to talk about this in the public domain very soon because it's not right, you know, and the public need to know the difference. Uh, and they don't. So, you know, we've got people locally, people running around who, who've got no qualifications whatsoever, but they go to all these network meetings. They're professional will writers. Well, there's a contradiction in terms there, and it's like an oxymoron. You're professional. Oh, you're a will writer, but where's your qualifications? And when you ask them, they get very uncomfortable. Oh, you don't need to. Oh, does that make it right? Does that make it right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we push. I write to Lord Chancellor every now and again to say, why are you not addressing this, you know, Legal Services Board? They love to, to bring this in, that it becomes regulated. Uh, because I think the public need protection, don't they? Mm. You know, that's the thing. So that, that's a, a weird area, weird area. Uh, and people who don't commit to professional qualifications, whatever, you, whatever field you're in, there's something wrong there, isn't there? Something mm, yeah, wrong. I think so. I think it's always best to go on with the knowledge base of knowing yeah. what you're doing, just yeah. even for your own, your own credibility. I always yeah. yeah, but it's like you said earlier, you don't know what you don't know. No, so the exactly. Dunning, Dunning Kruger effect, isn't it? I always <laughs> mention it. Yeah, yeah, he's mentioned this to me yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so absolutely. he told me about Dunning Kruger. Tell, yeah. tell him the story. It's good. What the, the original? Yeah, story? go on, tell him. Yeah, yeah. no, it's good. It's a okay. good story. So, so the uh, so the story comes. So Dunning and Kruger are two researchers who looked into this this uh, story they discovered about a guy who walked into a bank in America. Um, he didn't have a disguise on, broad daylight, walked into the bank, uh, robbed the bank at gunpoint. Turned around, walked out. As he was leaving, he looked up at the camera and smirked. Left bank, walked up the road, walked into another bank, robbed that bank, walked out, got arrested. And when he got arrested, he was quoted as saying something along the lines of, I don't understand, what about the juice? So they interviewed him later right. and said, you made this comment, what did, you, what did you mean? And basically he'd read somewhere <laughs> that the active ingredient in Visible Ink was lemon juice. And he was so stupid that he thought if he smeared himself in lemon juice, he'd be invisible to the cameras. Oh my god! So they they did all the usual, they did the due diligence. He wasn't insane. He wasn't no. intoxicated. He was just really stupid. And he know so he just knew so little about this subject right. that he thought he knew everything. Right. <laughs> so Dunning, oh, I like that. So Dunning, like that a lot. So Dunning Kruger started looking into this, and they started asking people coming out of exams, yeah. um, "How did you think you did?" And they found that the people were like, oh, fucking disaster, messed it up royally, yeah. did really well. And the people that, yeah, smashed it, did terribly. And it's this idea that if you've got a subject which is, you know, 100% and your, your knowledge of that subject is 10%, yeah. you might know 50% of that 10%. 
So you think you know half of everything there is to know, but actually you only know 5%. Whereas some people, they know enough to know how much they don't know. Yeah. So they'll know, they'll know, they'll know 40%, but they know they don't know 60. Yeah. Um, so they think they don't know a lot, but they actually know a lot more than somebody who thinks they know a lot. That's the Dunning Kruger effect. That's, that's, that's good, isn't it? Yeah, not no, no, that. neither did I. So yeah. I, I loved it as well. Yeah, yeah I loved yeah. that. Yeah. And interestingly, at, at Flow Martial Arts, where we're yeah. doing training now, um, if you look across, yeah, yeah, so they've, I'll they've, they've done, yeah. Oh, there's that, that, that Dunning Kruger bar. bar. There. Yeah, yeah, that's what it's called. The, uh, yeah, the Dunning that's Kruger clever. Bar. Yeah, like yeah. That. and it's because when people come into a new a new field or a new subject, they fit in yeah. fucking everything, and often they know nothing, but they just don't know. They don't know nothing yet. No, no. Um, and I think to your point with, with that, if you've not done the qualifications, yeah. then you just don't, you, you'll think you know more than you do. Yeah, and absolutely. there'll be so many things that you just are unaware of and therefore advising people poorly on. Yeah, absolutely. So that's why it's so important. We, we've got an example and, and amongst, you know, a few sort of colleagues around the country, we talk about this on LinkedIn particularly. I love LinkedIn as a tool. I think, yeah. you know, it's, it's a great tool for professionals, but it's becoming more like Facebook and, you know. It is, yeah. And, and what we would say is... Uh, there's people on there who who go on and say you need a willpower of attorney whatever for whatever reasons now some of the reasons are valid you know they're correct whether that person's qualified to execute that is something else uh, and yet they've got this fluffy persona on there they've got look at us and they've got lovely branding uh, and they talk about the five houses they now own uh, and their holidays in the Seychelles or whatever. And this is obviously, you know, at the expense of these clients who think they've been dealing with lawyers. And it's just unacceptable. So some of them need to be called out because uh, they have no professional qualification whatsoever. And I think, I'll go on about this till I'm blue in the face. Yeah. It's, it's unacceptable. Uh, but you talk to the authorities and they just go, oh, well. They're not really that bothered uh, because they say there's not been enough incidents or evidence that this has caused families distress, you know, when, when it's all gone wrong. Well, there's lots of evidence out there. It's just collating it all again and presenting it. But but that, that's a major project. But in the meantime, they, they run along unregulated doing what they want, you know. But you say that even if it's one, do you know what I mean? If it's one family, yeah, it's like, many, it, like it? yeah. So yeah. say like yeah. I went and done that, didn't know that. And they, you know, I got screwed out of, you know, X amount of money or my family did. That's, that's enough, isn't it? That's enough people to say it needs to be regulated, you know? Yeah, no, it's a scary thought. But yeah. yeah, I'm glad we spoke about it because I think that's a really important message. Yeah, good. So, good. Is there any, any anything else that people should be looking for in regard to experience qualifications when selecting the right person? Uh, I, I think... It always sounds quite a trite point, but check their Google reviews, honestly. You know, we touched on it before. I think it's really important, you know, people... People in the main, if they if they feel they've had really good service, they they will put a Google review. And if you're if you're visiting a site, and maybe of a firm that's been around a long time, and they've got five uh, five reviews, you know, and one is not great, and the others are okay, uh, you gotta ask questions, aren't you? What's what's going on there? Uh, I'm not saying people should have hundreds and hundreds of these things, but but it, you know, it gives a fair sort of uh, litmus test of what what's gone on with the service levels. Because I think sometimes with legal matters, that's that's all you can differentiate yourself with is, you know, how how approachable you've been and friendly, and you know, and you, was your service really good, you know, and on point. And we all mess that up from time to time. But in the main, you know, you 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 try and stand out a bit. You know, it's that purple cow thing, isn't it? Which Seth Golden yeah, wrote. Yeah. He's trying to be a little bit different and. Uh, and stand out amongst the crowd and, and uh, you know, we are purple, I can't, you know, and, and there's a reason for that. And, and it, it works for us, but we really try and sell on the, the friendliness, approachability, fixed fees, plain English, yeah. and just quick turnaround, you know, and uh, uh, give, give people what they want. And sometimes they don't even know they need it or want it, but yeah. we'll give them the right advice. And uh, yeah, that, that's why I'd look, but look for those qualifications. So TEP, Silex, or obviously a solicitor firm, you know. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, mate. Thank you. Um, so let's hear about uh, Port Collis and, and your company because 22 is quite young to get going with a legal firm, as you said. Yeah. That's the last thing I was thinking about. Still is, to be fair, but so I guess 22 <laughs> yeah, I would have been thinking about it. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> um, and, you know, here you are 35 years later, um, as, I, as I touched on a minute ago, um, sort of sponsoring some really decent sports teams. Um, but doing some amazing things as well. I mean, it'd be interesting to hear about, I guess, where you started, but also some of your visions and, and where you're going. Because we've already touched on the four-day week, but we should really get into, to, I guess, where the idea came from and 
and what you've really seen as a result, but also some of the other things you do. You talk about the ICE conference. It'd be good yeah. to hear about that. Um, and then a couple of other bits that I, I, I wanted to learn more about the Infinity Service and the Sleep Out as well that you've done. Yeah, so sure. Take us back to 22 and, and how that got oh, going there. Do you know a friend of mine that I, I lean on a lot for advice at times, even though he's, I think he's about 20 years younger than me, actually, but uh, he, he's one of those wise old heads, you know? Yes. Uh, whereas I'm full of full of ideas all the time, and so, so you had a two year old advising you. <laughs> it was a bit like that, yeah. It was a bit like that. But we we talk about. Uh, he always refers to you know what would twenty two year old Trev do? Yeah. So when I when I've got a problem in the business, or or you know I don't know someone maybe not be working as hard, or, uh, you know he said you wouldn't accept that. You you would have gone out and found people, and you would have gone. To, and I said yeah, no. He said so. Don't cut people too much slack. You know, and and uh, I know where he's coming from. You know, but for me, it was about. Uh, it, it's a weird story, but when I was uh, when I was a student the first time round, uh, I I was fortunate enough to have two summers where I worked for the Sutton Trust, which uh, you know they've got quite a number of estates in Plymouth, and they were left by William Sutton years ago via a will. You know, back in I think it was early 1900s, where he left his estate uh, for the poor. That's, that's how it was phrased, and to provide housing for them. So this Sutton Trust, still around to this day, provides housing. And fortunately, a very good friend of mine, his, his dad was the local superintendent who looked after these estates, so quite senior. And, uh, and Ron was kind enough to give me a summer job two, two years running. So, uh, I mean, Danny knows me quite well. I, I wouldn't say I'm a DIYer or a gardener, <laughs> but I had to go and do these things for the summer. So I was 19, 18, 19, and I'd go out and do these things. And there was a guy I met on there, and uh, I can't remember his name. That's the saddest. And I'm good with names and yeah, faces are, and yeah. places, and I just can't remember his name. Uh, and I only worked with him a couple of times, and uh, he gave me two pieces of advice that I've, I've sort of lived by. <laughs> and uh, one, because don't forget, I'm I'm young, and I I'm uh, you know at that stage, fit, athletic, long blonde hair, you know, I was, you know, <laughs> sex on legs, and you know? not not. <laughs> and so I'm out there working, and he says to me. Uh, Take my advice, son. He said, uh, how old are you now? And I said, oh, I'm 19. And he went, yeah, don't get married till you're 30. He said, oh, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't recommend it. Oh, did you get married before 30 then? He went, no, no, I am just wouldn't recommend it. He said, <laughs> I, I've seen lots of people who've done that and uh, it ends in tears. I went, well, not everyone, you know. And he said, uh, so how long have your mum and dad been together? I said, well, they got divorced when I was very young, you know, five, six. And, and he went, there you go. You know, there's a point. <laughs> I went, well, that's not a point. <laughs> and anyway, it went on. And he said, just don't get married until you're 30. You've seen the world. You've travelled a bit. You've done some things. And uh, and that was his advice, right? So it just stuck with me. And and as you know, I didn't get married until I was 37. Now, I'm not saying it was his fault. Uh, I just think no one would have me, you know, up to that point. <laughs> and, uh, and the other thing he said, which always stuck with me, yeah. really solid, uh, he said, what do you want to do as a career? And I went, I, I honestly do not know. I said, I'm doing business studies at college and, and what have you. And I, I know I want to go into business. I don't know what field. He said, oh, you'll find something. You'll, you'll like one. He said, what subjects are you doing? And it was law, marketing. I mean, I love marketing. The irony is I should have gone and done that, to be honest, you know. But uh, but I, I like law as well. And he said, you'll find it. It'll come to you. He said, but do yourself a favor. He said, uh, go and work for some, uh, his words, not mine, shit houses. He said, because then you'll learn how to be a boss. Uh, but he said, uh, if you do end up working for someone, always pick your boss and not your job. And uh, and I thought, that's, that's quite deep, really, you know, because, you know, you need a job for money and you've got to pay bills. And 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 I consciously did that. I, I, I looked for people. I think I've only ever had three, three maybe four bosses. Uh, one was outstanding. The other three, not so. And... Uh, it's you learn lessons that way, don't you? But it, it it drove me to the point when I got to you know twenty twenty two almost twenty three, and and I remember saying to my mum, you know, I want to run a business. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. I'm going to claim. And uh, and I just saw the back then the legal services uh, had been deregulated in in some uh, respects, a bit like the opticians had in nineteen eighty four, which is a random one. But I just thought, well, there's an opportunity here to go out. You know, I'll, I'll get qualifications in that field. I've said my business studies, but I thought I'd go out and get qualified in law and uh, and go from there and try and create a business. If I if I could deliver a service to someone at a fair price and and I'm hopefully a nice person and uh, and do a good job, they might recommend me on. But on that note, I will tell you a story about the fir- one of the first clients I had, and and so it was that. It was about uh, trying to provide something that's a little bit different. 
uh, the uh, the reception I got from some people, you know, trying to get help off them was <laughs> less than helpful. And that's why now I always help uh, young entrepreneurs, whether they're college, school, universities. I sit on the MBA board at, at, at Essex University, which I'm really proud of because lots of them are from big businesses there like Rolls Royce and, you know, Huge, you know, huge companies, and here's little Portcullis, you know. But I, I think I bring something; they wouldn't have me on it else. And uh, and I think it's important to give back, isn't it, to to help your local community, whether that's projects like you said, you know, through sporting clubs. And it's not just Argo at professional level; it's it's grassroots as well with Morley at Plimstock. I mean, they're the biggest football club in the city in terms of number of teams. I think it's 25 or something now. It's huge, and that's girls' football, women's football, you know, men's and um, boys and. Uh, and so with, with entrepreneurship, I think it's either in you or it's not, you know. And whilst I think everyone can run a business, whether they can run it well is a different thing altogether. Uh, that support, though, is really hard to come by, especially oh, being young, nightmare. especially being... Nightmare. We'll always give people work experience. We'll always uh, give them projects. We'll give them dissertation support. Uh, we'll give them summer work, internships. And, and that's where we've built a really good relationship with the local institutions, you know, so... Uh, so we get asked to things that we wouldn't normally get uh, asked to, I guess, if we didn't do that. And it's it's great because it's opened up our world, you know, and to, and it's great to see people want to do things, as we said earlier. But the the one weird thing, when when I started the business, there's, there was two, uh, and I'm writing a book at the moment, as, as you know, and, and I'm going to put some of these anecdotes in there because they are ridiculous. Uh, one of them was uh, I was told to go and speak to this leading mortgage broker in Plymouth. He was the man, you know, back in 1988. And uh, I didn't really know because I didn't really know a lot of people in that field. And and I thought, I want to build a business working with other professionals. So, uh, so I went to see this guy and uh, met his receptionist who was charming, you know, and she sort of gave me a heads up and, you know, sort of said, well... Uh, it can be a bit challenging uh, as I'm sat in reception <laughs> and uh, and I hear him in his office and all I can see in his office through this glass door and it was in uh, oh, Wimple Street at the top of town uh, and he had his feet on the table uh, there was like a glass of whiskey alongside and I could see cigarette smoke on it it was like some old movies thing you, you wouldn't see it now you know and uh, and he was shouting at somebody on the phone and this girl she called Kathy I remember her name and she said oh you can go in now and see him I won't say any names because it's unfair but I work with his son now which is ironic uh, and so uh, so I go in and I said look I'm, I'm setting up this business I need some help I've been told you're the main man is there any way you can just give give me a client or two I'll even do it free just test out, uh, you know, if I'm good or not. And if I'm not, don't use me, but if yeah. you can. And he just looked at me, puffing on his cigar or whatever it was, and he just said, uh, listen, son, I don't know who you are. He said, I don't know where you've come from. He said, but you're right, I am the top guy. Uh, and so me making usual quips, you know, well, it's nice that you're modest as well, you know. And, uh, and, and he said, uh, listen, go away, get some experience and come back when you're really good at it. He said, because I can't entertain a junior, you know, and all this, you know, which is quite patronising. And, uh, and I swore then to myself, I would never go back to him. And uh, so I go. And then uh, when the, uh, we had one of the, the uh, oh, what was it? The America's Cup came to Plymouth in 2011. So you see, it's ingrained in my memory. And I'd not seen this guy in all those years. And uh, his son had become a mortgage broker. He, he's a great guy. And I think he's embarrassed about his dad sometimes. And uh and I bumped into him at this event I was at and he said, oh, we've never met, have we? So I started to describe because <laughs> because the people who'd invited me, they were going, oh, Trev's, you know, really good at this. He's been around. And uh, I said, oh, do you remember? Uh, I said, uh, quite a big guy. I said, slim, but big. I said, who came to your office back in the late 80s and you, you were drinking whiskey and I was describing this, long blonde hair and I haven't got a clue. He, he didn't remember any of it and why would he? But I, I said, I remember. I said, because you, you didn't give me an opportunity. I said, that's why now I give other people opportunities. I said, so I've got to thank you for that. <laughs> and he was quite taken aback, you know, but he had no recollection of it at all. Uh, and I just think, what a wasted opportunity, you know, uh, to give someone a help on a ladder. It doesn't matter what field they're in, what age, what background, just give someone a bloody chance. Open the door, you know. But the what that creates for you, though, is that gives you the drive to be able to do sometimes what you've done. Yeah, And my only thing is nowadays with people, and it is great and people do need more opportunities, but that opp that missed opportunity or from him and your, that rejection that drove mm. you to be who you are. Yeah. And sometimes now kids in, like, in general just may not have that. 
No, they don't, don't have that hunger and that fire in the belly sometimes. You know what I mean? No. That that's caused you to drive you to the top. It of has, your game, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And there was never any uh, like vengeful thing about it. It's I'll show him. It was no, not yeah. about that. But inside, I just it sticks I, in your I head, did think it? that. I yeah. think well, I'm I'm going to go out and yeah. you prove know, them wrong. Yeah, and but there were other guys who did help along the way. That was superb. Yeah, you know? and. Uh, but but the other the weird thing was you know I've I've always been a voracious reader of books you know I mean you see the the library in our in our office and uh, I, I love autobiographies you know motivational stories all that sort of stuff people's success and failures and and uh, I was reading a book by a, a leading sales guy back back in the day so again late eighties I think he was called Richard Denny and it was something about you know building a business and being really successful in sales. And, and I saw myself as, okay, I'm not sales per se, but I've got to have some skills, you know, and to, to, you know, persuade people to use me and, 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 you know, buy things. And, and there was this one element of the book and it talked about referrals. So it said, you're, you know, you're duty bound when you're in front of a customer or client to make sure that they pass you on to somebody else. And here's how you do it. So he had this, I don't know, number of lines that you must use on a client. Obviously, you've been happy with the service, uh, how I grow my, but you've seen it all on people's footers on emails now. And, uh, and, and I, I just became obsessed with it. And I thought, right, right, next time I see a client, you know, because I didn't have many clients. Uh, it was like one a week or something, you know. And uh, so everything was on this client. And, I, and I, I, I got an introduction to these clients who lived at Peveril. And uh, again, I won't say the road, but you know all those roads that go down? Like, I, live, I live in one of them. Yeah. yeah, there you go. So I've got the worst car in the world. I'm, I'm 22. Uh, I've got this. And it's Quite ridiculous. a few roads up, did you, mate? <laughs> so I had a, and, you know, bearing, I've always been wide, you know. Like, I'm obviously heavier these days, but I was wide, always wide. And uh, I've got a Fiat Uno. Now this oh, thing, <laughs> yeah, this class. pale green, this bloody awful colour. And, uh, and it was so bad you couldn't open the door. It, it, it stuck, you know? And uh, so I had to climb out the window. So I thought, well, I can't, I can't park outside the house <laughs> in a suit, you know? I was all suited and booted back in the day. And uh, so I park at the bottom of this hill, right? Because I knew the clients lived at the top. So I thought, yeah, smart move. So out I get, <laughs> and I fall on the floor like a big lump, you know? Briefcase, it's the floor opens, you know? Remember them, briefcase? <laughs> and uh, so gather myself together, and uh, up I walk. So I go up the top of the hill, you know, straighten myself out. In I go. P- appointment went really well. Lovely people, quite young people in their sort of late 30s, uh, children, got it all sorted. And as I was about to new- use my new line, <laughs> you know, because I don't have lines, I'll, I'll try this one. It was along the lines of, uh, uh, do you know anyone who, who could help me grow my business? Because obviously you've been happy with the cert. Before I could say anything, she went, Oh, I've got someone who would like to see you. She's asked me if uh, if I got on well with you and you're a nice guy, if you could go and do their will. I went, oh, that's brilliant. So uh, I'm beaming away. I said, all you got to do is, is write it down on a piece of paper. I'll give them a call uh, probably tomorrow, you know. And uh, she went, yeah, I could do that for you. I could do that for you. So she starts writing down. She went, better than that. I'll take you down the road because she only lives down the road. And it's my sister. And I went, oh, lovely. You know what's coming, there, don't you? So as we're walking down this road, I, I, I'm thinking, oh, no, don't go all the way down the road. And uh, so we get halfway down. I said, oh, where, where is it? Oh, it's the last house on the end of the road. Oh, where's your car? I went, oh, uh, yeah. I said, oh, don't, worry about, don't worry about my car. We get down there. We go up the little steps there, yeah? Knock on the door. The sister didn't let herself in. She just knocked on the door. This woman opened it and she looked at me. Before her sister could say anything, she went, you are ridiculous. That's the first thing she said to me. <laughs> and I went, oh, you saw me, didn't you? <laughs> and she went, she said, I've just been telling my husband that some clown has got out of a car window, <laughs> built like a brick outhouse, and he's fallen on the floor. And I went, yeah, I said, I saw it. So this, this, this other woman's going, what on earth are you on about? I said, oh, it's just my car there. I said, and the doors don't open. And she said, uh, you need to earn some more money, don't you? To get? And I went, yeah. She said, come in. She went, so I went in. We didn't do the will there, but we, yeah. we uh, 
you know, we got on, had a cup of yeah, tea yeah. and all that, and I came back another time. But it was like when you talk to, you know, younger people today and you say, look, you, you'll have some ridiculous journeys, uh, just embrace them and laugh at yourself. Because you can't take yourself too seriously, can you? No. You know, oh, and, oh, and people do sometimes, you know. Yeah, way too uh, much. Way too but much. It's, uh, it's just, it's an, I think it's a nice anecdote because it proves the point about when people see you these days and everything's like hunky-dory. And you got a they, nice car. Well, yeah, but they, they think it's overnight success, don't they? And, you know, yeah. you hear that about bands, though, don't you? They they get a hit and people go, wow, where did they come from? They've been going for 12 years on the circuit. Yeah. You know, it's all the yeah. hard yards you put in, isn't it? Yeah, you know? no, so, it's definitely that. It's, 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 funny, it's funny to speak about bands when you were saying about that chap you popped into, told you to get out. Yeah. I think that's where the name Led Zeppelin came from. I think they were called... Was it? Yeah, I think they were called something different. They went into a record label right. and the producer said, fucking no way am I signing you lot. You'll go down like a Led Zeppelin. Right, that's literally what he said. So they left, oh. and right, changed your name and fucking proven wrong. Fantastic. No way. Yeah. That's good. So, uh, yeah. I like that. It's good. a big motivator, isn't it? Yeah, it really yeah. is. Because the other one along those lines is uh, uh, Tim at uh, Weatherspoons, isn't it? Where one of his ex teachers, who was not nice to him at school, was called Weatherspoon. Right, and, uh, oh, and he God. used that as a rock. No yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Look it up. Look it up. <laughs> what, he called and, his old company Weatherspoon yeah, just because of his teacher? Yeah, because of his teacher. I think along the lines of, uh, again, maybe urban myth, but I, I've seen some of it online, yeah. where, uh, yeah, you wouldn't amount to anything. You're not going to go anywhere. And uh, and that, here, here we are. Imagine yeah, that. Constant reminder, though. Constant reminder. It is. Constant yeah, it reminder is. reminder looking at that. It is. Yeah, uh, wicked. It is yeah. interesting, yeah. Yeah. It's it's what motivates people to, to yeah. do things, you know. Mm. Uh, no, that's good I saw something recently actually it was talking about um, that people are often more motivated not by the uh, want to achieve something but the fear of failing at something yeah and I, I think when so. you remind yourself of that I think often yeah. people are more successful I think so yeah 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 interesting so we've come a long way then mate uh, yeah it's been a good journey yeah. you know I, I still don't think uh, you know I've done very much I honestly don't at times and that's not me asking for people to go oh you've done great it's, no it's not like that in my, in my head it's just I'm still doing the same job I did all those years ago obviously better hopefully uh, I think you know we've built a nice business in terms of they, they've got the values I want in a business you know in terms of being good to people being kind trying to do the right thing all the time be brilliant in terms of qualifications and advice and all that sort of stuff, but to do the nice things around it, you know, and, and that's given us the opportunity to do things in the community. So, which leads on to the sleep out really. I yeah. mean, so tell us about that. Really proud of it because it was just one of those things I, I thought of, uh, it was before lockdown. So we did the first one before lockdown and, uh, it was just a case of, you know, we got friends who work at Shekinah and, and, you know, you hear about the soup runs and you, obviously you, you're aware of the homeless issue and that. And, and I just thought, well, what, what could we do? You know, and it doesn't raise a massive amount of money. I, I, I think this year we raised 5,000, but uh, it's where people can sacrifice their, their Saturday night when Argyle's away, obviously. Argyle is a partner of ours, let us have the stadium free of charge. That's their contribution. And we just let people in who come and pay I think it was 15, 20 quid. And they sleep in the stadium overnight. Uh, it, honestly, it's so communal. It's lovely. You know, it's really nice. And it's never that cold, you know, because <laughs> people come armed, you know, they bring yeah. their sleeping bag. We, we have put a ban on tents now because we had people turning up with tents. That's, no, you're supposed <laughs> to get the experience. It's always uh, the second or third Saturday in November. It depends on Argos fixtures, obviously, because when they're away, you know, we can go there. Uh, and and the great thing about Argyle, honestly, a fantastic club. They they always make sure that any of the players and the coaching staff that come back to the ground after a away game that day come and see everyone. And they come over and they do. I mean, Shuey came over last year. We got Nance comes over. Some of the players come over, and it's great because there's a lot of kids in there, you know, as well yeah. as well as you know actual fans. And uh, and it just raises awareness and raises funds. And and we do it. And I think when you start it <laughs> every every year. It's like, oh my God, I've got to sleep outside again. But, you know, these poor people have it. Mm. Have it every day, day, yeah. We go and have a shower, don't we? We have a breakfast. We have, um, yeah, it, it's a real reality check. And I'm glad my children have done it, even when they were, you know, much younger, because it's grounded them. You know, they, they know we're, we're lucky what we've got. I mean, okay, you say you're lucky because you've got it all. Well, we haven't got it all, but we work hard to get those things. But there are people through no fault of their own sometimes, you know, mental health, isn't it? Or, you know, a divorce or a bankruptcy oh, or falling so out of the family. Bad so will. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah there's, there's, you know, there's all sorts of reasons that none of us know. We don't know their story, do we? Yeah, me, so, me working in the city centre for years, there's so many different reasons why, especially, again, it's not being sexist, but a man ends up homeless and they go down this path that they just can't get out of you know like you said they split with their partner they got nowhere to go you know maybe they get an addiction to drugs or alcohol you know they their partners leave them or they're abusive because of that and they just they get into this spiral and once they're homeless it is fucking impossible it's difficult to get out of oh they they just can't mm. there was a there was a guy who used to be my customer and he would be you know you know coming with the kids normal you know buy games do everything you know um he got he got addicted to drugs his wife kicked him out he's you know he's still homeless now and yeah that was maybe like five six years ago you know and he just can't can't get a get a house because obviously he can't get a job then because you know he can't get off the addiction and it's just you know that that side of stuff we don't realize how easy that is to get into and we take it for granted not just because of you know our family and what we've created but also having your family and not just like your, your wife i mean your mum your dad some people don't have that you know or they don't have that that background and that's where it's really easy for especially a man to fall into that and the reason it is for a man rather than a woman obviously because of children a woman really would never be homeless because of their children does that make sense whereas a man it's so fucking easy yeah. Yeah, it's, it's quite scary actually like you said people can fall very quickly oh but so quickly you know and so uh, quickly yeah it is yeah it's very humbling with it all and and you do it for all the right reasons because you just you want to try and make some small difference you know yeah. and uh uh it's one of the best things we've done you know i mean we look at things like the four day week yeah. that's probably the best thing i've ever done in business in terms of what it's done for the people we work with and, you know, and... Uh, Did that help the business as well? Oh, like, ma- obviously, massively. nationally, I think you was in the papers and stuff like that, when not you? Yeah, it's one of those weird things where, you know, I touched on earlier about work for the boss rather, or pick the boss rather than the job and, and, uh, and you know... I've only had one boss and he was a right knob. Was he? <laughs> <laughs> it was poor. <cool. laughs> it's... Uh, one of the, my sort of great things is uh, that I'm very proud of, even though it was in the Sun. With all due respect to the Sun, uh, it named me as the best boss ever because it had this. <laughs> is that what it and was? there's us yeah. with our team because not only had we done the four day week, we we put their salaries up at the same time, and no one had ever done I that. Wanted to, I wanted to understand how you did that. Yeah, you asked earlier, actually, didn't yeah. you? And I know we went off on a tangent, as a tend to, you know. Uh, it was every year, I think. As a business owner, we you know we should try and be innovative in our little space, and whatever our subject matter is, you know, and, and the service we provide, uh, as we said earlier, we're a little bit grey at times in, in legal profession. Just try and do something that's a little bit different. And and that one year, so it was, it was uh, twenty December twenty eighteen. I remember saying to my wife Michelle, uh, "Let's try this four day week thing. What, what do you reckon?" And uh, so we chatted about it at home, and uh, I said, yeah, let's just introduce it. So you can imagine how hard the sell was to the team when they came back after Christmas, and you went, hey, I've got this idea. And I know they're probably looking around thinking, oh, what's now? Because I do come back with some you know, strange ideas at times. Uh, but that's the innovator, isn't it? That's, that's you, you're never resting. And uh, I said, how would you like the idea of 50 extra days off a year, and you're still on the same pay? Of course, they all said, that's a terrible idea. Let's not do it. So and what's the catch, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. Here's the catch. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to pay raise as well. Yeah, yeah. And I said, just to, just to sweeten it, as if it's not sweet already, we'll put your salaries up because I didn't want the outside world thinking, uh, are they cutting back? Why are they only doing four days? I thought, oh, it's, it's a thing. But again, uh, an academic told us that no one else had done it. Yeah. They'd done the four-day week, you know, New Zealand and Sweden. And, and so, yeah, so we just brought it in. And I'm one of those, I think, find find reasons to do something rather than not do it. And and if it doesn't work, at least we had a go, didn't we? Was that, was that on reflection of how well your business was doing? Does that make sense at that point? Uh, was it was it like sort of incline or was it at that point? No, it was more about their welfare for me. It was about how... Uh, how could we look after them a bit better, you know? And uh, and I think, well, hopefully anyone who's worked for me will say, uh, you know, I'm a decent person. I'll always try and do the right thing. Uh, but I felt we could go one step further and bring in this 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 innovation, really. And and, it, and it's worked. And, and honestly, the PR we got out of it was phenomenal. Uh, and I uh, bet you didn't expect that much. Did no. You? you know what I mean? Like No. And it wasn't done for that, you know. So locally, uh, William Telford at the Herald, you know, as was, got hold of that. And uh, he ran the story, and then all of a sudden it just exploded. And so we had articles in India today, which you can still find online now. <laughs> yeah, you can find uh, 
there's Australian lawyer. I think there was some in the States. I mean, it just went everywhere. We were getting calls from all of them. So then they wanted me to go on the radio with uh, Gemma Atkinson and, and all that. On the, so we did an interview on there and she asked if she could have a job. No, she kept calling me. <laughs> the funny thing was, she kept referring to me as Trev. And the the other two uh, was uh, Comedy Dave was her, her sidekick. Yeah. And oh, I, I, f- I forgot his name now. Uh, Gethin, who's on The One Show a lot. And... Uh, and and she was so familiar with me, they kept saying, uh, why are you calling him Trev? You just want a job done. And she said, yeah, I'll move down and all the rest of it in four days. And, and it was great. And it's, it's been marvellous for the business yeah. because people see us in a different light now. They see, when we talk about being kind to our customers and clients, mm-hmm. they can see we're also kind to our staff. And, uh, and I'd good, be much more willing to give my money to you than I would uh, a solicitor. Traditional sort of, yeah, like, I know, you know what, what I mean. Like that sort of, yeah. like I always think straight away, you can walk into a solicitor off, you think 200 quid. Yeah, Do yeah. Do you know what I mean? That type of feeling you get yeah. to it, you know. And, but um, it's interesting to hear that because it is about, you know, you do things for the right reason, don't you? And then it's the unintended consequence, which sometimes can be bad. But but this was marvellous because a very good friend of mine, Matt Begley, who's an IFA down in, in Cornwall, he, he gave us an introduction to one of his clients. And, and the line was, he said to me, she's a, a, a well-known film director. Uh, sadly, her mum had passed and uh, she wants, you know, estate administration and probate, you know. And so can you help with that? I said, yeah, of course we can. He said, but you will find her so difficult to get hold of, but be persistent. So we just kept ringing and ringing and ringing. She was filming on the Yorkshire Moors, actually, at that time. And... Uh, and then when we got hold of her, one of my colleagues said, oh, you know, it's, it's me from Port Callis. And, and the first thing she said back was not thanks for calling or whatever. She said, look, I'm really, I'm really busy at the moment. I'm in the middle of film. You could hear the wind, apparently. And she said, are you that firm I've just read about in the Daily Mail? And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's us. She said, well, if you treat your staff that well... You must treat your customers amazingly. So you've got the business. I don't care what the cost is. <laughs> and, and that was an unintended yeah, concept. Yeah. And she said, we can use that anywhere with her name on it. That's we class, haven't, yeah. so I'm respecting that. But yeah. uh, but what what a benefit. Because yeah. if they think if you're looking after them, you, you've got a decent firm, haven't you? you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I fucking love it, mate. I really do. I think it's great. Wish more companies did the same. It, it's happening though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That movement is there, isn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> it, in, in, in part, I think. There's still a long way to go, isn't there? And I, I still feel like there's a lot of organisations where you've got you know people doing the job of like two or three people still. Yeah. And I get that, that a lot of businesses are hurting as a result of the pandemic and everything else. But it's just, it's not how you get the best out of people, is it? No, it's not. You know what I mean? As, as Danny alluded to, I've worked in leadership roles for a bit. I've never run a business, but... You know, I've I've worked with individuals and, and observed how you get the best out of them, and it isn't by just no. putting them on the you know in, in the meat grinder and, and working them to death. You know what I mean? So I think it's great. I was curious when you said that it was successful. You've obviously given some um, unexpected reasons why it was success, uh, successful. How did you measure it with like I guess performance of the individuals that were affected by it? Yeah, K- KPIs really. Yeah. Uh, just in terms of you know what we expect from them uh, and uh, and a what sorry. Key performance Sorry, indicators. key performance indicators. Sorry, uh, and uh, it, it's just making sure that they were they were achieving their own targets for themselves as a as a career, you know, and and their own aspirations. And as long as it matches with ours in terms of how we need the company to grow, and you can measure them that way. So that that was good. Uh, I think as well, you know, constant conversation with them all the time about what's good, what's not. And we've had different models of the four day week, you know, where everybody's got the same day off. Some people take a Wednesday off. It's, it's you know it's mix and match, and uh, there's very very forms of it. But I I think the four day week is an easy label for people to understand. Yeah. But I think these days it's more about just flexible working, isn't it? Yeah. Respect people's home life as well as their work life, and try and fit something up that you know it's not just in the interests of the the employee, but works for everyone because it's got to work for the firm, isn't it? Yeah. And and I understand some sectors can't do it. Yeah. I, I get that, you know. And it's not for everyone, but but be a bit more flexible in your thoughts. Yeah, we had uh, we had a guy in a few weeks ago, Dan, who's a, a senior leader, works in the L and D industry, and he, he would have loved this because his whole mantra is um, purpose, not process. Right. And the idea is that it's about the outcome. Yeah. 
why are we doing something? It's not a case of just working five days because you need to work five days. It's like, what are we trying to get out of those five days? Yeah, yeah. Can we still get the same outcome that our four days? Yeah. And you've proved that you can. Yeah, yeah. So like yeah. you were saying, you'd rather do one hour of good work than five hours of yeah, shit. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, so. It's yeah. funny because the academics are now obviously looking into all this with their research and they talk about, it should all be about productivity. I yeah. get that. I understand that completely. Mm. But also, it's about other things like retention of good people that yeah. want to stay, won't they? Why but, would but they go the same, But I feel that's the same thing. Like, if I'm working yeah. for a business that I want to be working at yeah. because they're good to me, I'll yeah. work fucking harder for them. Yeah, yeah. I'll break my back for, like, people yeah. that that, yeah. that deserve it. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. 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 And recruitment, you know? I mean, <laughs> it's a double-edged sword, though, to be fair, because sometimes you'll attract people who just want a four-day week. They don't care yeah, about your okay. firm and your values and your culture and all these things because they're important to us. Yeah. And you can see they just want to, you know, so they don't get very far. Uh, but but also, I think, uh, and, and you, you mentioned to me earlier, currently our team is all females except for yeah. me. That's not intentional. That's just they were the best people for the job at the time. But, you know, some of them have children and that, and they can balance their life a bit more. And if that works for them, fantastic, you know? I guess uh, it comes as well. You get less sick days. You get, you know, like you said, less sick days, more productivity, all that type of stuff. Point. Because, yeah. you know, with kids and everything yeah, else, yeah. you know, if they have a four-day week, yeah. they get an extra day off. So if yeah. their kid is poorly, it's like, oh, it's all right if I have today off instead of maybe Friday just yeah. because you know yeah. he's ill today and then yeah. they're still not missing a, you know it's true as long as it's a bit of flexibility there yeah. yeah I mean my colleague Morgan who I talked about earlier she she's labelled it and we all use it now that's her life admin day so she always has Fridays off mm -hmm. so she does all the things you would normally do on a Saturday yeah. uh, on a Friday so yeah. now she has a full weekend with her partner yeah, and it's lovely. much that's so lovely. they come back work more refreshed you know? yeah uh, yeah so yeah, it's 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 a great thing, and it leads on to like the ice conference thing, where yeah, that was all about. Uh, it, it, you know, there's a lot of networking things going on out there, and I'm not a fan of networking. You know, I'll do it in my own way, but normally one to one or a couple of people, and uh, and I just thought there's there's a little sort of hole in the calendar where why can't we bring people together of all walks of life that have got stories to tell. Uh, it's a bit like, you know, podcast type stuff, isn't it? Where stories to tell who've been innovative, creative, who've had tough times, whether that's physical, mental, business, yeah. uh, religion. We've had Johnny Mercer in talking, you know, and and, and there's all sorts of uh, people that, that are invited. And they come in, they tell their stories and, and to an audience that are ready to listen. And, and that's audience. We, we, we put it open. We don't charge for this. So uh, we, we do it at Argyle every time and... So innovation is, uh, sorry, ICE is innovation, collaboration, entrepreneurship. So it covers a wide, wide area of life. And uh, and everybody always goes away feeling invigorated and, and feel they've they've picked up something along the way. And we it's become an event in our calendar now. And people ask us, when is it next? It's always in January, yeah. A, because it's icy and cold. <laughs> uh, we always get Toby doing his ice thing, as we said earlier, yeah. ice, ice baby. And it's just a nice space where it's wide enough for... Uh, people are from all levels of the spectrum and whatever business or you know, education they're in, they can come and share their stories. And we've had some great speakers. So we had Spaceport Cornwall this year. Uh, like I said, we had Johnny Mercer before. We had uh, Dave over at Tamar Fresh, who's brilliant family story. Uh, they built the business out of nothing. Yeah. And, you know, and everyone's got a nice tale. And, and Toby and Joe spoke this year as well, yeah. which was which was great. And... Uh, yeah, it's just giving everyone a chance. And and we had the youngest entrepreneur ever at our event there, which was Toby's boy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, selling yeah, sweets. Antonio, so he's selling sweets. And we <laughs> tried to it. push it on the mind. Toby kept coming up to me going, Trev, Trev, tell him there's more sweets left. And honestly, <laughs> said, what am I? You're a front man or something, you know. And uh, But yeah, it was great. And it's, it's lovely to give people that opportunity, you know. So, uh, so it's good. And we just try and be creative in what we do and try and be different. Like we said earlier, the purple cow mentality is just just stand out a little bit and uh, differentiate, you know. Yeah, amazing, mate. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. I think, I think, I think, I think that's, that's pretty much it, yeah. That's yeah. really good. Yeah, mate, yeah. mate, thank you so much for coming in. I think the, the information there was it's amazing. Um, I personally found it super interesting oh, and I'm sure our, our audience will yeah. appreciate some of the insights there. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Like I said at the start, uh, you know, Law can be grey and dull, you know, but I think if you make it a bit more rainbow coloured, uh, people might actually sit up and listen a bit. And, and it's a personal thing, you know. It's not. I know people think about it, like we said earlier, death, documents, illness, whatever. No, it's the, it's the kindest, most thoughtful thing you can do for your family and while you're fitting well, you know, so get it done. Yeah, brilliant. We'll make sure we put all of your details in our description, mate, so they Appreciate can find that. you. All right. Thank you. Brilliant, Thanks very much. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, mate. Pleasure. Thanks, mate. Dun, 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 dun. dun.